It's not as if she were a, a maniac, a raving thing. She just goes a little mad sometimes. And I say, insect a man, death should always be painless. She just goes a little mad sometimes. We all go a little mad sometimes. We all go a little mad sometimes. I caught him, Sheriff. Wait, who is it? Ah. Billy Loomis, sir. Pardon me, I'm uh, Loomis, Dr. Sam Loomis. Uh, I think our friend uh, Sam Loomis didn't know that Marion was here. Oh, Sam, I hate having to be with you in a place like this. Now, just listen to me. I want to go down the street to the Mackenzie's house. I want you to tell them to call the police. The car. Drive down to the Mackenzie's. We must be mad. Literally mad. Watch a few movies, take a few notes. It was fun. Good evening, everyone. How are you doing this fine and noticeably cooler evening? I hope you're all good in chat. I hope you're looking for a third episode. 73rd? Is that right? 75th? It looks like I can't see underneath the StreamYard logo. I'm going to say. That looks like 75. Either way, I think we it is 75. In... Well, you put you put in the title here 74 of the Look, stream. I am a complicated individual. It, it's <laughs> I'm hedging my bets <laughs> here. It's somewhere in the margin of error. <laughs> e either way, if it's if it's the 75th, fantastic. If it's the 74th, well, we'll have a 75th episode. And if it's a 73rd, we'll have a 74th and a 75th. So Mergut said 74, and Mergut has never been wrong on he, any call. <laughs> he is a reliable source. Oh, fact-checked by Mergut. I love it. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Well, uh, TCG, you are with us. That is always good. How are you doing, sir? I am very good. Very good. I'm still hot, though. But then my I house is like a heat trap, so I've got the window open. Uh, I should be all right. I've got a nice cup of tea. Uh, the kids are in bed. It's going to be, I think it's going to be a really good stream tonight. Oh, yes. I, I, I'm i I'm hyped as well. Um, and I think we're going to have no problem staying in Super Nanny's good graces. Um, this film's like 77 minutes long. Yeah. Which the price really short. So short. So very short. Yeah. Um, but we're not covering it alone. We're joined by a returning guest, Simon. How are you doing, Simon Roberts? Good, good evening. Pleasure to be here again. Thank you very much for, for inviting me back on the show. And uh, good evening, TCG. Uh, I take it you're a veteran of this stream. I, I sense uh, a long history here. Is that right? <laughs> you could, yeah, you could say that. <laughs> yeah. All um, the way back, you know. Really, really looking forward to this. Yeah. Like, like Ashanti, he, he's not always there when I call, but he's always on time. <laughs> well, I did give you my heart. Was that a Leah? Yeah, yeah. Who that was, was that? That was a Shani. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm. Don't ask Harry; he wouldn't know. <laughs> no, 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 not at all, not at all. Yeah, TCG's been here since the since the very beginning, before he was that crime guy. That's right. Way, mm. way back way, in the chat. Back. Do you want some nostalgia? Go for do it. You, do you remember? Was it February 20? No, February 21, I think, when my computer had been roasted by what I found out was an incompetent repairman. Oh, how's that for the nostalgia? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> the old avatar's back. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, um, I, I had my, I upgraded my computer and an incompetent computer guy, uh, cause the cpu to get roasted and so i couldn't do any editing and so i was like, ah i haven't put anything out for three months fine fine i've been thinking i should do it i'm gonna do it i'm gonna stream and i was bricking it more than more than i usually am and tcg was there for that very first one as was harrion so and rose if i remember and rose, yeah rose at all yes who came back for the brain dead episode i believe mm covering that yeah. um yes uh yes uh questions where is harrion um 
I am not really at liberty to specify Harrian's location, but all I'll say is, well, you know how the Tavistock closed down? And you know how it's hard to get your hands on petrol these days? I, I can't say any more. I can't say any more. I don't want to land him in it. But he's <laughs> wow, been a that's boy. <laughs> yes. Adventurous lad. Adventurous lad. Can I say I was impressed by that trebuchet? Um, but anyway, I won't go into the details. We've got so much to cover. Uh, I was going to focus on the uh, modern remake, but I didn't manage to see it. However, I thought it might be a fun chance for us to do uh, one of the old channel favourites. I thought we might play a little game if you uh, if you fancy that. Nah, up for it. <laughs> Damn it, TCG. Well, majority. <laughs> As if I care about votes on this channel. Well, I was going to say, I was outvoted two to one, so uh, democracy wins again. I think benign dictatorship is the best way to go here. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> um, well, we're going to have ourselves a fun little game of Play Your Stars Right. Yeah. And this may be familiar to you guys. Here we go. <laughs> that Theresa May walk gets me every time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm very fond of it. I'm very fond of it indeed. Oh, folks. Um, if you didn't see it the first time we did this, this is just a daft bit of fun that I enjoy very much. Um, if you did see it, I, I expect you are going to be absolutely pounding that like uh, to see the joyous return of Play Your Stars Right. It's very simple. We're going to take a fun little journey through a, uh, uh, a film stars catalog, the filmography, and how they were rated by the extremely reliable critics on Rotten Tomatoes. And uh, all you have to do in the manner of the old game show, play your cards, right, is guess whether you think uh, critics rated a specific film higher or lower than the previous one. And we can mix it up if you want. We can do a uh, critics round and an audience round. It's that simple. And uh, see how we do on time, but maybe maybe we'll have a chat round if uh, if chat wants to play. I've set the latency on this low, so we should be, uh, maybe we'll be okay. Um, Simon, would you like to go first? I'll try. I'm not still really sure how it works, but go ahead. Tell you what, let's go with Push, push me in it. Oh, okay. you okay. straight in the deep end? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go on, go on. All right, fantastic. Okay, this should work, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Here we go. Star number one should be Jodie Foster. Mm -hmm. Are you a Jodie Foster appreciator? Not particularly, no. Ooh. This round could be difficult. Have you seen <laughs> a great... I mean, I don't know. Have you actually watched lots of her movies, but just sort of hate to, to be honest, I can only really remember her from Silence of the Lambs and Taxi Driver. And uh, that's about it. Ooh. TCG, any better? Um, Jodie Foster. So oh, what was it? Freaky Friday? <laughs> mm. Oh. Um, was she Freaky Friday? No, that was, was that Jamie Lee Curtis. Curtis. Jamie Curtis. Uh, but it was the Panic. Was it uh, Panic Room? She was uh -huh. in that, wasn't she? Yeah. I think. And she got uh, the Oscar yeah. for The Accused, right. didn't she? Tell you what, I think you guys should team up on this one. Oh, let's do this. Uh, I may be slightly biased in my Jodie Foster fandom, um, but you got you you team up, see what you think. We'll see how it goes. So, um, for a warm up, yeah, exactly. Some Bugsy Malone. She goes all the way. Back. Oh my god! Yeah, Bugsy, of course. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. So we're going to start off with the brave one. This is Neil Jordan's uh, 2007 uh, vengeance thriller. You know, critics, not a massive fan of it. 44%. They didn't go for it so much. Do you think they liked Flight Plan any better? It does have Sean Bean. I'm going to say they rated it higher. Me yeah. too. Yeah. All right. Okay. No. They did not like Flight Plan. They did not like the premise at all. 
Chat, do you think they were harsh there? I think that's a little harsh. It was a silly film. But I don't think it was 37% silly. How about Little Man Tate? This is one of her more serious features about her struggles as an, uh, as an irresponsible mother raising a boy genius. Hmm. hmm. I, I would... I'm going to go higher again. Hmm. Yeah, okay. I'm feeling like she's picked the script because it's kind of Oscar fodder, isn't it? It's it's mm. the next thing down from playing somebody who's uh, dis disabled or mentally incompetent. So you you play someone who's kind of um, socially marginalised, and uh, you uh, you cross your fingers and go for your Oscar. Oh, so, Simon, that is so cynical. How could you say yeah, that's completely okay, but, correct? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. seventy three percent. They loved it. I believe she did actually win an Oscar for that. Mm. <laughs> Crumbs. <laughs> what do you know? Um, you might want to fact check me on that one. Um, I know her first one was for The Accused. But how about, in a very different vein, one of her very rare comedy roles, Maverick, from the mid-90s, starring spicy fact spiller Mel Gibson? Tricky. Well, it's, it's a genre piece, isn't it? So it's not going yeah. to be take, taken seriously, is it? It's going to be just um, a bit of fluff. I don't know. I, I feel like I feel like because it's a. I, I feel like the older you go, the, the the higher they the higher they rate the films. I, I don't know. Although I feel like this is a bit of a trap. Uh, oh, would I do that? Yes, you would. Oh, I'm, yeah, you played this before. Don't I you? tell you what, I'm going to go with Fez and Mergu. I am going to say lower, but mm. I something tells me it's going to be higher. But let's see what let's see what happens. No, I think lower. I'm going to go with my instinct on this. Yeah. Uh, you know, I tend to sort of overthink it, and then I end up. No, that's watching. good. Get into the critic's mind, and you're correct. Ah, 67. yes. Hmm. Respectable, very respectable. So, how did critics respond to Panic Room, a dark thriller, a David right. Fincher directed one, and a very early role for Kristen Stewart? I liked this film when mm. I first saw it, so my internal bias as some might say i'm gonna say higher i reckon it's the sort of thing that critics will probably think is facile and crowd pleasing so i'll say lower we got a split opinion here okay i'm playing to the inherent snobbery of critics <laughs> no they they liked it remember there was girl power in it wrong again also well directed i would say uh, you mm. know it's not finch's best but it's it's pretty good it's it did it did good. yeah i mean it get a little bit silly towards the end but like the sort of like the first and second acts i thought were were, were pretty good tension the tension and the uh from that film was it, it worked for me yeah they it's a thing of it's such a tight premise but then yes you are really in you're really gonna have uh trouble uh developing your story you know if you've got to fill a, get to feature length, a restrictive premise is going to make that very hard. Okay, we're seeing, oh, you are getting prodded here. Uh, this is probably mm. not a difficult one. Silence of the Lambs, winner of five Oscars for mm. Best Picture, Best Director, Best Screenplay, Best Actor, and Best Actress. Lower. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be brave and say higher. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Maybe, maybe, maybe like one or two percent higher. All it's right. higher. It's higher because you you kind of in the era of of uh, you know the sort of frank embrace of the pause now. So the critics mm. are having to sort of lord it because it's a story of a feisty, powerful woman who overcomes all the odds. Oh, but it, I don't know. Does it demonise transsexuals? Oh. It, Actually, that's my no. thing. Oh. If the, if the <laughs> critics were going to be analysing it today, if it was a film release today, like Psycho, they probably. Yeah. Uh, they probably have something different to say about the film, but well, yeah. Critically. We did cover it actually briefly that they go out of their way in the film to uh, say that Buffalo Bill is not in that ilk. Um, partially mm. because of films that had these themes were getting protested a lot in the late eighties, early two thousands, sorry, early nineties. Oh wow. Um, if you, if you want more on this folks, if you missed this, uh, I covered it in the first stream we did in June. I talked about why Billy and Stu were not gay. A very safe bet here. Silence of the Lambs, 95%. Mm. 
Can't believe they stinged it like that. I know, right? Genuinely, I, I love that film. It's so good. All right, folks. How do you how do you feel about the little girl who lives down the lane? Now, I imagine this is maybe not a household name. I imagine some of the, some of the folks in chat will have seen it. Um, this is a very early Jodie Foster. This is pre Taxi Driver, so she's about twelve in this, um, and it's basically Hard Candy, uh, but made 30 years before that film, starring Martin Sheen as a bit of a nonce. Oof. Now, I wanna, I'm going to say lower, but I'm not, I, I genuinely don't think it'll be that much lower. Because I do think the critics like nonces. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Did I say that out loud? It's basically <laughs> a, uh, a two-person, uh, what do they call it, a two-hander? <laughs> um, hmm. Oh god, that sounds not not like that. Not like that. <laughs> I'm going to go lower as well, um, without knowing any. I mean, I make a, a point of being incredibly badly informed on most streams, but I think um, I sus I'm suspecting that uh, the worthiness of the subject or the um, you know the uh, subtleties of the script are something that's probably lost at this time in uh, in uh, in filmmaking. This this feels like it's it's going to be. You know, worthy but poorly executed, or something like that. That kind of verdict. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I thought I'd keep you on the line, bait it mm. with like. Oh, well. There's got to be a trick here. How is she possibly putting anything next to Silence of the Lambs? <laughs> yeah. Um. Incredibly well reviewed. Uh, although you'll notice 14 reviews to 140 reviews. Um, the wider consensus might bring that down, but the people who see this film tend to appreciate it. And I do believe it's on uh, Amazon Prime if you want to check it out yourself. It is huh. it's a, a dark gem of a film. Mergu um, in the chat says Polanski. Did, did, he didn't have anything to do with this film, did he? No, no, okay. I don't believe so. I don't believe so. No, no, no. Um, I think we've got time for one more. Uh, let's go ahead. It is quite cool. Anne Hathaway? I might skip us past, but Anne Hathaway. Hang on. Don't memorize, memorize these scores at all. Here we go. Keanu Reeves. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah? All right. Team up again, guys. Team up. This right. is working. I tried yeah. to start off as close to the middle as possible. And 51% yeah, for Destination Wedding uh, with Keanu and uh, Winona Ryder is is pretty darn middle of the road. I'm going I'm to hazard a guess and I'm going to say higher. But again, I don't think it will be that much higher. I'm thinking all right. sort of around the 60s. If, if there is no familiarity of Johnny Monomic, it is um, mm. an OG mid-90s cyberpunk with uh, Dolph Lundgren. I believe Rutger Hauer's in it briefly. I might oh, be really? wrong. And there's a, there's a cyber dolphin, too. I'm going to say lower. Uh, the name Dolph Lundgren at that time, I think, just speaks uh, of uh, straight to video. <laughs> I know it wasn't, but it, it it has that air. Do you know what I mean? And 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 having Rutger Hauer in a film at that point feels a bit a bit like fan service in a way. If you know what I mean, it's 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 just you know hoiking him in for a, a nanosecond or something like that for yeah. uh, his Kinda cachet. Like Rutger Hauer in the cinema, Udo Kier, straight to video. I I think it's harsh too, but what can I say? Who's the um? There's the guy, uh, Christine Slater was like the big name star. And then there was a guy who was the slightly cheaper Christian Slater. Uh, what was his name? Stephen Dorff. Oh, and, yeah, yeah. What, the guy, was he the one in Blade? Stephen Dorff? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll keep you out of suspense. Okay, Johnny Monomic? No, they didn't like it. 18%. Oh. Oh, wow. Anti dolphin sentiments in critics have to be addressed. Um, 
But how does that compare to Eli Roth's 2015 or so? Knock, knock, a uh, kind of a home invasion film. Um, you're going to get to know it very well. Uh, we are going to cover it when I work out what the heck kind of arc I can put it in. Um, it's a very confusing film. Two, two dangerous women try and seduce uh, Keanu Reeves. Uh, oh, is it just like a normal and it day goes for downhill him? from there. Mm. Sorry? Oh, right. Is it just like a normal day for him then? They just follow, the, follow him around yeah, the camera. Yeah. It's, um, um, yes, it did. It, that's what... I saw her in this. It was one. It was what that moment of oh gosh, I've seen. Yeah, he has Keanu Reeves, um, Pork, his wife. Which, um, yeah, I don't know. I know right. what to even think about that. Okay, he I had um, the same hairstyle as Keanu Reeves at the time as well. <laughs> I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna say higher just because I, I, I don't think it'll be much. I've got a feeling it won't be much higher, uh, especially if we're going to be reviewing it at some point. Uh, so. <laughs> I think Harry, yeah, there you go. Yeah, that, that little chuckle there tells me everything. Okay, oh yeah, I'm going to say higher, and I'm going to say around about the 25 to 35% mark. Okay, Simon? Mm, I'm going to play it safe on this. I'll, I'll go marginally higher as well. Correct, mm. correct. Um, hey. You know, they, they didn't love it, but they didn't hate it. How does that compare to... Uh, 1998's uh, Devil's Advocate by Taylor Hackford, starring, oh, Al Pacino. Why did that name disappear? <laughs> Why can I not remember Al Pacino? Oh, my goodness. Okay, uh, I'm going to go higher again. Is that because you just love Al Pacino talking Cantonese? <laughs> do, do you know what? I, I I don't think I've seen this film. Have you not? No, no. There's like a well, weird was... theme going on there in terms of like Knock Knock and Devil's Advocate are like two of the most confusing boner films uh, you will ever see. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm still going to say higher. Okay. I, 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 hey, I feel Mr. like. <laughs> Mr. Gently Benevolent, welcome to the stream. Good to see you getting up early, getting in on uh, Play Stars Right Quiz. I just want to say hold hold. Yeses. Whole mm -hmm. who asked if I know the if I if I if I um knew that they found out the identity of the Summerton man, uh, I I did a video an hour and twenty three minutes ago, which is uh which is available to view after this stream, of course. After the stream, yes. Priorities, people. Yeah. Priorities. Hold your horses. Hey, a suit visual. Get get your bets in. What do you reckon for the next film? We're gonna. I think um, Simon, did you? Mm. Place I'm going to go lower. I'm going to go lower because uh, I'm just going to operate on the theory that Keanu bashing is a uh, hobby for critics. Um, but it might be the danger is it could be pulled up by what I'm going to call the Pacino effect, that it might mm. actually affect the uh, critical uh, appraisal of the film. Yes. That Al is going to carry more of Keanu than uh, Keanu carries of the film. Yeah, that's kind mm. of what I'm thinking. I'm thinking higher just because it's got Al Pacino in it. Yeah. Because, um, I mean, I mean, Keanu, don't get me wrong. I think uh, during that sort of time, I mean, he was he was kind of a big name in Hollywood. But I, I unpopular opinion, perhaps to, to to many, but I I don't actually. I think Keanu Reeves is a you know really good, like, nice person and all that. Um, but he's a very wooden actor, and, and I think you're absolutely right, Simon. And I think mm. at that time probably would have needed like bigger names, probably more established actor, carry him through those films. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's although although, although there is a possibility that um, you might get a little bit of Pacino bashing as well, because there is that. I think there is a sort of period where people begin to sort of go, "Oh, he's chewing the scenery again." This is definitely, yeah, it's early for that, but he is definitely mm. doing it. Mm. But you are correct. You guys are correct. Maybe it was Pacino <sighs> carrying the day. Mm. Maybe it was a, an early cameo from uh, Heather Matarazzo and the guy who played the creepy bug assassin in season two of Buffy. Who knows? Either way, <laughs> definitely more appreciated. I'm now at the age like I can't watch anything without being, oh, what's he been in? What's she from? I can't, I can't stop myself doing it. So I watched that film and I'm like, oh, it's a creepy bug assassin guy. He was made of maggots. <laughs> I can't stop myself. How do we feel Constantine uh, compared to this? A very underrated film. Yeah, I think it's underrated. 
uh, I watched it not not long ago actually, and I quite liked it. But the fact that you said underrated yeah. makes me think that it's it, going to be be lower. It's a clanger. Yeah, that's what mm. I'm reckon, reckoning the the critics are going to do to it. This is the thing. I think it's. I think it might be one of those light like, cool ones where the where the critics review skewed in the opposite direction towards the audience. I think the audience will probably rate it higher, much higher than the than the critics did. Yeah, very, very, very often go with the audience. To be honest, mm. um, yep, there yeah, you go. your your instincts are mm. right. The audience loved it. Critics are snobbish, um, and Fez is absolutely right. Yeah, Peter Stromer was oh, so yeah. good in this. Yeah, so so good. Jaimon Honsu was uh, also very good, riding the waves from Gladiator. I, I, it really upsets me that that film didn't do well. It, it's such a beauty. And uh, it uses Keanu really well. It doesn't make him do too much. I don't want to sound harsh. It's sort of actors can tend to have a thing that they can do really well. And if you just make them do that thing, it's fantastic. All right. How do we feel? Constantine compares to John Wick 3. Oh, I think it's really interesting that you've gone with the third one. I think if you'd went with mm. the first one, it'd be a bit of a no brainer. Um, I actually really like the John Wick series, uh, all three of them, but I know that the third one wasn't as well received as, as the first one in particular, especially the first one. Um, and the second, not so much. <sighs> Although I think it would be higher but not too much higher and i think it's the f it's funny but the first two films i think would have carried the score upwards because it's a uh it's it's like a, it's obviously the the, the trilogy is like a, a continuation from the previous mm. so I, I feel like the first two would have given it would have would have given the third one a bit of a push for a higher score than if it was a standalone film if that makes sense yeah. Okay. Okay. Simon, what's, I'm, what's I think I think lower. I think I'm I'm hearing words like um, critics are going to say things like tired, and they're going to say the first one was probably just derivative um, revenge uh, porn uh, flick. Anyway, uh, they're not. Um, I enjoyed the first one, but again, mm. it, it was it was it was just a bit of fun. There was nothing terribly terribly deep about it. But I can see critics being harsh on um, any you know the, the longer a franchise goes on. All right. Okay, bets are in. Oh. See, I, I'm curveballing wow. you. Yeah. Wow. You just got balled. Sorry, to, sorry to say so, folks. Yeah, they they really. Oh, possibly Fez. Fez may have a, an idea what's going on there. Hmm. Oh, okay. How about the original John Wick? Right, lower okay. because this is the sucker punch now. That's, yeah, that's what you're doing. Yeah, okay, I, you know, I, I said all that spiel about it being oh, not that much higher, not that much higher, and then you go and slam this in our face. Um, I th I'm going to agree with Simon. I think it's going to be lower. All right, not much. Okay, not much lower. Yeah, you're, they they will they would have said derivative game. about the first one. That's what they would have said. Very yeah. very meta. Very meta. Mm. You are correct. Who? <laughs> <laughs> ah, oh, yes. Okay. You you saw through my ruse. <laughs> yeah, I I I'm massively confused by that result myself, but what could I say? Yeah. It's a it's a minor difference, but I, I found that really weird. And I think this might be the last one in the Keanu Reeves slate. Um how do you think John Wick compared to <laughs> speed? I'm going to say it now. I, I think this is going to be in the 90s. So I'm going to say higher. Uh, what do you um, reckon, chat? Lower. Higher or lower for speed, chat? Going for lower. It's one of his signature films outside Atrix and, and Bill and Ted. I'm going to mm. say, I'm, I'm saying higher. I'm going counterintuitive at this stage. I'm putting all my chips on lower. Let's do it. Okay. All right. Chat's going for lower as well. Okay. 
All right. Okay. Whoa. All right. Oh, smashed it out the park. Oh. What Don't ask about speed two, says Fred Blogs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we, or we speed don't. three. <laughs> There's oh, a well, third one. Father Ted fan. Father Ted fans. Oh uh, my goodness. goodness. Yeah, yeah, it was um, it was on a milk float. Very, very good fun. Very good fun indeed. Okay, okay. I think I think we'll, we've uh, gone over half an hour here, so that um, I think we'll we'll call it for uh, play your stars right for this week, and maybe it's a good time to start talking about the film. Before we do, I, I genuinely think this should be like its own little standalone series that you do on your channel. I'm just going to put it out there. Chat, if you agree with me, let me know. Uh, let, let Horror know. Let's have some stars in the chat. Yeah. All right, chat, give me um, give me stars in the chat if you want me to do a stream that's nothing but um, quizzes and uh, play your stars right. And we'll do a quick stream like that for fun. Let me know. And uh, while you're doing that, I will uh, do a little plea before we get into the film, the meat of the stream. Uh, if you like what we do here, uh, you know, Susan doesn't, but you guys hopefully do. And if you do, smash that like, knock that like out so it collapses on the ground in a comatose condition and awakes somewhat cold. If you think what we do here is is enjoyable, is detailed, is... Uh, worth supporting, then I want you to just fly a plane straight into that subscribe button, smashing it, costing costing the lives of everyone around. That That's how we chill, right? This this is probably why Susan doesn't like me. She'll big or go home. I know. I, I still, I don't think I'm, I'm on that turly wavelength. <laughs> Just realised I'm muted. I was going to say, if Mr. Baldwin can get away with shilling violently towards the like button and the five-star review button on Spotify, then why can't we do it? Why can't we? I, I, I believe in the dream. I believe in it. Yep. Um, yeah. You know what to do. You've watched live streams. Get that like all smashed. Subscribe if you haven't subscribed already. And if you are new to the stream, um, say hi. If you're watching on the replay and you like what we're doing, Leave a comment, you know, it all helps. And uh, say hi. It, I'd like to know who's watching, you know. And uh, also, I, yeah, I won't go big on it, but if you, if you want uh, to see more of me and support the bigger projects I'm working on, you can join as a member either here on YouTube or via Subscribestar. It's all in the description. I'm not going to talk about it for ages. There is exclusive content that you can see and you'll get early access. So I'm going to leave that there. Uh, before we get into the film, any shilling that you would like to do, Simon? No, nothing in particular. Um, I'm uh, pretty quiet at the moment. I'm not doing quite as much uh, streaming. Well, I wasn't doing that much streaming recently anyway. Uh, but I'm sort of dropping off because of work commitments and sort of outside stuff. But I'm trying to pop in for the odd culture stream because mm. uh, I enjoy it. I like finding you on like random uh, political streams. Yes, yes, I do sort of pop up in odd places, and uh, that that works for some people. I'm probably, you know, probably better, uh, you know, doing that sort of thing, you know, where I get invited on sort of slightly left field shows and have to do a bit of homework for a change. Otherwise, I just I just ramble on interminably. <laughs> you hide it well. You hide it well. There, it's a joy Thanks. to listen to. Um, and TCG. Oh, oh. Uh, at 7 p.m. UK time this evening, I released a new video uh, about the Somerton man. Now, this is a <clears throat> excuse me. This is a case that has been done to death on YouTube, and so I previously sort of held off from from covering it on my channel. That was until I learned that there were some huge, huge developments uh, with regards to the case. Uh, I'm not going to spoil it here. Go and check it out on my channel. Um, I would like to think if you're into sort of unsolved sort of cases. Um, then this one should be right up your alley. Um, in terms of things like other other bits and pieces, I am going to be a little bit quiet over the next couple of weeks just because I'm I'm taking some time away to do some family time. Um, so in terms of things like live streams, uh, I will be doing part four of Soma on the 29th of August and uh, Freaking Florida Man Fridays return on the 2nd of September. Nice, nice. 
And uh, we have a, a fun thing in the works as well that uh, I think we, we're saying sort of early September we'll get that out. Uh, that hopefully, necessarily... hopefully. Okay. This, this, this is the new secret project. Because the, the other second one is... secret project. Yeah. Well, the first one isn't so secret now, is it? But <laughs> no, no. I've I always need a new secret project. Um, I also say tomorrow uh, I am doing the second and third of three filming sessions for what might be the longest video yet. I don't know. I'm not sure. Oh. It's def. It's going to be a long one anyway. You're going to enjoy it. Uh, we are being called out here for. Um, for weak Turley shilling. Uh, do either of you fit, can can either of you channel Steve Turley? Do you reckon and, and do a Turley I, shill? I don't watch Steve Turley. I I've, I've, I know very little about the chaps, so unfortunately, not no. No, no. I, I only really know what I mean. I was trying to watch some, but the shilling broke me. <laughs> it was you. You're always so close to the content, and then you get swerved into a shill. And it was it was genuinely breaking my brain, and I had to give up. I'll it say is... this, chat, chat. Who does it better, uh, Steve Turley or Ben Shapiro? Ooh, I haven't watched Shapiro for a while. What's his shill method? I, well, it's just the segues, from what I remember. Because again, I haven't watched him in ages, but I just know that he segues mentally. I think, I think Sitch and Adam uh, uploaded a, a clip from there from their channel mm. uh, very recently they were talking about or they were looking at a video that his sister put out and i only saw the intro to their video and his sister has an amazing game in terms of segueing into the product that she's about to promote very very impressed oh i i, I think i've remembered doesn't you chat you can correct me if i'm wrong i i seem to remember that shapiro kind of speeds speed runs his shills like he'll he just rattles through them so quickly. Like he's mm. got business to do. He's contracted Shit. to shill bowl and branch, and he'll do it. <laughs> and he'll just like the, it's it's passionless. It's like a Terminator shilling, you know. Amazing. No mercy, no feeling. Just shilling bowl and branch <laughs> or Squarespace. I might do like a little shill review. Maybe one of the things we'll do. Um, Oh, that's what I should do. In the quiz, we'll do a name that shill. I'll just have the Ooh. text of the shill, and you have okay. to say who shilled it. Right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so true, Fred. So true, we almost forgot. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry, I'm getting so distracted by the shilling talk. We should, we should move into the movie. <laughs> Although I'm really liking the idea of the Pokemon style. Who's that shill? Oh, it's shill. This is probably going to sound like a slightly uh, slightly arse looking comment, but I think Academic Agent's uh, uh, Turley parody shilling is probably the best because he does it in such a lovely, flat, and emotionally dead way. <laughs> but, um, it's it's I, supremely I, enjoyable as a, as a yeah. as an emblem of the uh, the fakery of the online uh, shillmeisters. And mm. I'm sure he'd tell you. It means it so means much. So much. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh gosh. Okay. Right. We will move into the movie because I'm getting distracted by shilling talk. We're shilling their shows on our own shows. That's how good their shills are, folks. Let's discuss Village of the Damned, aka the Midwich Cuckoos. This is kind of like a Village of the Damned sandwich, uh, mm. damnedwich, if you will in terms of the adaptations of uh, John Wyndham's story. Um, as it was a book, it sold the rights to be adapted as a film before it was even published. And uh, it was uh, made as Village of the Damned twice and has just been remade uh, under the name The Midwich Cuckoos as a TV series this very year. So very well adapted. We are, we are obviously looking at the first adaptation of it from 1960 because everything in this arc is from 1960. As, as I always try and ask, had you heard of this film? Did you have any familiarity with it before uh, I asked you to uh, review it for this stream? None whatsoever. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Certainly the the iconic pictures of the children from the film. Mm. And and I probably just, you know, I probably just dismissed it as a bit of fluff, but that's before I was invited onto the Prop Horror Show channel. Uh, see what I did there, and um, and re and realised, as I said in my tweet earlier, that you know a horror film isn't just a horror film. Um, there's always kind of something going on. It's always kind of tethered to its moment. But um, you know, that's my interest in doing this sort of stream is to bring a bit mm -hmm. of uh, you know the mild cheddar of historicism to uh, you know pop culture. And um, yeah, wow. so it's it's kind of obviously made an impact, but I didn't know why it had. Ah, okay, okay, I. Uh... American House. I think your comment about it being a, about a moment is very true. Very, very true. I think there's some there's some really interesting stuff going on here, which is perhaps not to current tastes, uh, which we will we will get down um, into. How about how about yourself, TCG? Uh, none. I haven't seen this. I hadn't seen the 1995 remake. I haven't read the original book. This was the first time. Uh, I'm not going to lie, I was a bit worried uh, as to whether I'd like this film or not. Um, but I suppose we'll find out as we go on. That's fair enough. That's fair enough. Um, I would say so far this is the weakest of the 1960 films that we've reviewed. I, I didn't dislike it at all. But in fairness, we're putting it in the mix with Peeping Tom and uh, Les Yeux Sans Visage and Psycho next week. So it was always going to have a pretty rough ride, to be fair. Okay. Okay. Um, and in a way, a lot of the things I like about it are things quite removed from the story, if I can put it that way. Um, one thing that was an absolute joy in this was all the glimpses of life from so long ago. And I know this is maybe a cheap point, but I find this every time I watch a really old thing, I get mm. fascinated by the tiniest things. Like, I, I get this up because I, I paused when they had this scene in a shop because I just wanted to look at the mm. packaging. Yes. Oh, my God. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. I didn't pause it, but I instantly look, went to look behind to see what was going on. Maxwell House. HP Source. I love it. And you also notice that the older style of shop where it's a lot more, you notice all the, mm. all the goods are behind her. You have to ask her and she'll hand it to you. Yeah. Yeah. It's a different time, different time. It's a completely different time, but before we get too far into it, um, Simon, would you like mm. to uh, take on the Guinness challenge this week and give us a, a quick pre -see? Uh, about the film, a quick synopsis. Mm. Uh, the the sort of thing if someone asks you, "Oh, what, what's Village of the Damned about? What's that one?" Mm. Uh, yeah. In the time it would take to pour a pint of Guinness, sleepy English village, uh, sort of a fairy tale setting in uh, the uh, late fifties, early sixties, is uh, mysteriously stricken down by a um, uh, an unusual. Um, short-lived malady of all the inhabitants becoming suddenly unconscious, then awakening, and it becoming subsequently apparent that all of the women of childbearing age in the village have become pregnant by no apparently explicable means. Um, there is um, an extremely fast gestation and birth of the, uh, the children that um, have been conceived apparently out of nowhere and these children are born um in very uh, they develop and are born in very quick time and are, are developmentally very advanced and uh of extremely unusual um and striking physical appearance and ex of extremely high intelligence for their age mm. uh this uh confounds and um disturbs our hero dr zellaby played by george sanders and uh um, from there uh a, a, a tense uh and uh, you know provocative um examination of um the uh the disruption of uh, sleepy village life unfolds uh, when the uh, the children begin to manifest uh, sinister uh, extrasensory powers uh, that uh, uh, that um, begin to exert a uh, a dangerous control 
on on the villagers and uh uh, Dr. Zellaby uh, becomes uh, increasingly fixated and fascinated and uh, uh, tries to find a way to, uh, to uh, let's say, reach these, these children, understand where they've come from and, uh, and, and counter their increasingly malevolent influence on the village. That's without me giving any spoilers. Yeah, I think that's grand. That's grand. Um, so forewarning, uh, from here on out, we will spoil the entire movie. We're going to discuss <laughs> it in depth. I mean, I, I I say this so often. Um, we are not like a lot of the horror movie channels on the YouTube. We don't we don't give you a seven minute review, which is a quick skim over the synopsis and tell you, yeah, the gore was pretty good. We we don't do that. Our USP here is that we will go in depth. We will try and look a little more in the context, and we'll try and delve in, go into detail that are not usually friendly for the uh, higher time preference crowd. Possibly why Susan keeps his channel down so much, um, but possibly other reasons are behind that. Keep spoiling her favourite movies that she that she hasn't watched. <laughs> Say favourite movies, but she's like, oh, I'm going to go and watch this for, oh, horror show. Oh, let's talk about, oh, she spoiled it again. Oh. Right, shadow ban. You snooze, you lose, Suze. What can yeah. I say? What can I say? Oh, what, what are some first impressions you had of, of this setup then, TCG? Loved it. Loved it. I, I thought it was a really good, uh, really good start. Um, I was a bit, I was a bit apprehensive at first. I won't mm. lie. Uh, as soon as I saw George Sanders, I was like, oh, Christ, I know why you've picked this film. <laughs> and, uh, the old but, George um, Sanders, yes. Yeah, um, I thought the way that he passed out was absolutely hilarious. I've I'd ne I've never seen someone pass out so in such a camp way before. It was brilliant. Like the hand was all flopped down and everything. It was. It was great, um, but in terms of the like, like what was going on with everyone passed out, uh, I, th I, th I thought it was quite interesting. Everyone was like really confused about it, and um, I, I, I liked that you know they were trying to determine what it was. And one of the people said, "Oh, you know, it could be a gas," and they were like, "No, no, no, it's not a gas. It's uh, it, it has defined borders, and you know, it, it you know, it's it's just as dense as that hedge over there, and." Uh, and and even they had like someone flying from over top to, to get a view and it was quite interesting that it had like this very specific area like if you flew f below five thousand feet then within that area you were gonna you were gonna get it and, and pass out um yeah i, I what i, I would have i think the thing about this film is because it's so short you know like, like i think mm. like we said at the beginning it's only what seven no 77 77 minutes, long. minutes. Mm. 77 minutes long nothing you don't hang about with any scenes you know it's very boom 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 to the, to the, next, to the next point um i would have liked to see this one that that opening scene sort of play out mm. a little bit more um but yeah I, th I thought other than that i thought it was a really really strong start really sort of like mysterious step and uh yeah that that from that from that moment i was okay i was like right i think i'm gonna like this there's something very interesting in the in the fact that we do have these starting scenes mm. so if you think back to uh i'm pretty sure peeping tom definitely les yeux sans visage and next week psycho you're going to see the old style of we get the full credits at the start of the film mm. this time we didn't no we were thrown straight into the action. We see them pass out, and then we get the titles. Mm. That in itself is a little touch of modernity getting in there. I see. I didn't really. I mean, I I, I didn't really notice that too. But actually, no, I was saying that. Um, yeah, no, I I, I, you know, I didn't really pick up on that. That's that's really interesting. Yeah, yeah it's, it's just a lot of the older it's a films. little way of it breaks up the action we we're thrown into something mysterious yeah and we're not really given much warning and if you're watching this yeah. in the 60s uh or 1960 itself you're sort of a oh oh right straight into it good mm. um i mean this isn't the first film to do it but um it was unusual there's, there's something a little bit Hitchcockian, isn't there, about the way it begins? You know, it's quite striking, as you say. You've got this kind of pre-scene, and you've got this sort of sort of Hitchcockian kind of drum and horn blare on the soundtrack just after the, the MGM lion does its bit. 
and then it kind of melts into a sort of flowery harp flourish setting the kind of classic um fairy tale background uh as the camera sort of it sweeps across the trees which is sort of is, is it spring or summer it, it's kind of idyllic a farmer is herding sheep and the camera kind of you know tracks along i think i mean i think that's you're clearly meant to sort of pay attention to that as a metaphor you know oh i have but, shots of that because it's so beautiful um I will and try and find it. You've got all this kind of um, classic imagery of, you know, sort of countryside fecundity, uh, uh, you know, everything's secure, the Lord kind of in his manner, in a sense. Um, mm. and, and, and the land, you know, you know, being tilled, you know, returning to life. Um, oh, it, it's very browning, you know, the, uh, the years at the spring, the days at the morn, the mornings at seven, the hillsides dew pearled. The lark's on the wing, the snail's on the thorn. God's in his heaven, all's right with the world. That's mm. your impression. I really hope that was Browning. No one checked that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, as it, as you say, it's idyllic. It's lovely. And this is an, an, another one of those things I just... I wanted to pause and just look at it and just see... Oh... It's a lovely rural English village. It's lovely. It's so sweet. It's a very nostalgic moment, isn't it? It's sort of peak mm. England, um, sort of depicted in, a, in a, a slightly sleepy, but a clearly very ordered way as well. Mm. And, and then, you know, as it unfolds, you, you enter that society again, and it's got a certain kind of deferential civic style, you know, quite formal <coughs> social relations, but the manners are all kind of very light, and the emotional temperature is, you know, it kind of either veers between people being, you know, sort of having an unruffled calm or moments of, you know, maybe at the most they might have a very contained huff, <laughs> you know, <laughs> about something, you know, a little bit of outrage when the boundary is being tested. But yes. um, um, I, mean, I mean, I always think of the scene later on where, you know, you've got the soldier going into the shop and the shop woman says, do you mind? You know, uh, mm, so it, it, that's mm. about the, that's about as excited as these people get, you know. Um, the moment the, that idea of the manners there's the, the thing for me that caught out and it was so english um everyone obviously looks up to uh george sanders's um uh zellaby crikey what's his name uh gordon zellaby gordon, um yeah. he's of i mean he lives in the manor house he's respected you know he's not the feudal lord but he is a respected figure and mm. the woman in the post office comes up to him to gossip to and complains about all the gossip and mm. he he just has this way of sort of respectfully politely dealing with her and whilst you know that he doesn't take her seriously he sort mm. of sends her off on like yes yes we i'm sure you'll help us shut down these rumors you know <laughs> well, it's interesting in film terms isn't it because the sort of tradition of if you like schlocky or horror films from the 30s mm. and the 40s um you know before you get into sort of proper 1950s style science fiction is that um the popular character in those sort of earlier films was usually quotes the mad scientist that mm. was the kind of figure that was you know and and now you see the the figure of the scientist is someone who is is urbane he's calm he's respected he's a kind of civically integrated figure living mm. a bit like li living a bit like an aristocrat frankly and that's kind of what's you know you see the massive house he's got and you know the sort of very elegant uh, study um that uh, that he's in so it it hints at what you pick up later about you know science it's now part of the establishment of, you know, sort of, of stable government and respectable authority, mm. you know, and he's kind of got almost like a, he wards off chaos in some ways. And that's why he takes that kind of paternalistic role in the village. And he's looked up to, even though he's not necessarily, uh, you know, we don't necessarily know that he's got any aristocratic blood or anything mm. like that, but he's got a, he's got a sort of pillar of the community thing about him. That's, that's, yeah, that's really interesting. It's quite a change from the earlier, idea of you know the scientist as a sort mm. of deranged threat I, i'd say um hammer horror has a lot to uh um a lot to do with that basically hey dom good to see you mate um yeah, yeah no, that, that, that's a really that, sorry that's a really good point that you make simon i mean if you if you mm. look at a, a film like peeping tom that we only that we only covered uh, uh it was last week i think it was two weeks ago or two weeks yeah. ago sorry you know the the 
oh, the psychologist in in that film you know is portrayed as an absolute nut job you know who's more interested in uh the main character's father than than actually you know he he just acted like a clown whereas with in in this film yeah simon's absolutely bang on the you know he he has got a pillar of community pillar of the community mm. vibes big time and you know you can tell he's a well respected figure i mean again like mm. later on in the film he's he's brought into um he's brought in as part of that that special meeting with uh, the the home secretary uh, and even during the initial investigations uh, when they when they were able to get back into the village after the whatever it was had, had cleared uh, you know, with the military there and whatnot, he was he was involved in in the discussions alongside his brother-in-law. I didn't pick up what his actual role was. It was more just he's a chap who has um, authority, but a soft power. Mm. Exactly, he's just a respected guy. It's nice. He doesn't. I don't recall him throwing a title round. No, I he's... think he's. I think his brother-in-law mentions it to one of the soldiers. Or to one of the officers, because uh, at, at one point he says something. Uh, the it's, it's almost like the the, the officer is about you know going to stop uh, Gordon, and his brother in law is like, no, 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 he's he's fine. He's ex he, he says exactly, but I, I think he mentions that he's a professor or something, and you know mm. he, he's like a, he he'll know what he'll have knowledge. Or he'll he'll be helpful or something like that, and they're like, oh, okay, yeah, fair enough. Mm. Yeah. Ah, very, I mean, we'll, he also represents, I would say, a certain approach, which we'll get into later, and it's a, it's an approach that wouldn't be challenged so much. Um, I was going to say, in the first half, there's something they do that I am an absolute sucker for, um, and it's when a film has a really strong premise. Mm. I really like it when characters spend a bit of time testing it out um, okay like this really reminded me of um as as something else that reminded me of was the older torchwood special series children of earth right that sort of thing where you have this weird phenomena and they test the boundaries of it they do little experiments um or cube if you remember that oh yeah yeah that that it's really interesting to me seeing people try and work something out mm. um and test it and take risks and this was done in such a gentle way you know you have a a bobby on his bike fall over mm -hmm. and they uh a lot of the early part of the film after the collapse of everyone is if i can find the image i need gosh darn it just, just while you're looking just, just while you're <laughs> looking for that image i just want to say like going back to mm -hmm. that bit um i found it quite funny when they get and, and this is sort of uh an example of how sort of like to the point this film is with each scene just to get the story moving because it's so short mm. it's, it's hilarious how like they they get the pilot to sort of you know descend down to get a closer look at the village and obviously you know he ends up passing out and crashes and it's like seconds mm. after the village wait you know the whatever whatever's sort of got a grip on the on the village it just goes and i just thought to myself if they waited for like 30 more seconds mm. <laughs> he wouldn't that they wouldn't have that pilot wouldn't have died mm. um mm. but yeah it's it's just interesting seeing them test the boundaries of it and work things out it's just mm. good you see clever people acting in a in an interesting way um as a sort of note of the sign of the times um they mention things uh, that, uh, that you would think of in this scenario, like let, it's a good thing no one was taking a bath or they'd have drowned. Mm. Now, ha have either of you seen the, uh, I can't remember, did you say you'd seen the John Carpenter version from 95? I've not seen it. I haven't. Either. No, I haven't oh, okay. Well, as a sign of the times, uh, Carpenter uh, has a similar thing, but drowning wasn't enough. He has someone pass out whilst using the barbecue. Hmm. And they yeah. fall face first on the grill. And, oh, it, it, it's it's very reminiscent, actually. This this particular shot you have here as well, of I mean, it brings to us nowadays a kind of the familiar imagery of the zombie film, doesn't it? Mm. You know, of of the quiet moments that society has broken down, mm. um, the world is stilled, but there's a sense that menace is heading towards us. 
and and it's the oddity of seeing uh, seeing the functions and dyne you know dynamic nature of society just paused like this and yeah. and as you say there's there's the levels of jeopardy that you construct imaginatively in between the frames as it were like um you know i was like you said about i mean i got <laughs> the first time i watched I, I was unusually anxious about the uh, the lady who was ironing her dress Mm. with with the iron burning through the uh, the You're iron the only uh, one <laughs> the ironing board so it's kind of like you have that instinctive response oh, oh gosh God, i hope they're going to be okay they're not going to burn to death or something like that i worried you know. about the house being flooded and destroyed uh yeah the, yeah the couple that had you, the, the tap running that made me really it's, anxious it's, yeah it's when Should your you mind know starts to run on yeah yeah I, I i do love that you said uh about it looking kind of like a zombie film because mm -hmm. when I when when they were going through the scenes, and I think obviously because it's a black and white film, I think it helps. But I, in my head, I was thinking Night of the Living Dead. Obviously, that that came out like eight years after. So mm -hmm. I suppose if anything, Night of the Living mm -hmm. Dead could be. And I, I was thinking of the remake, the modern remake of Dawn of the oh, Dead. Oh, really? You know, they have that ex mm -hmm. the extended sequence of American suburbia, and you know you've got a, like a drone shot tracking over it as cars are smashing into things yeah. and blowing up, and people oh, are yeah. sort of tearing people apart you know and, the, and it's just it's you just you know you're watching the landscape you know, deteriorate in real time and and as i say you, your mind is running on to all the consequences and and how would you react you know in this Same. in this sort of situation you know yes. you're looking at the people there have they been killed you know as, as the vehicles hit the wall and you know as it turns out fortunately it's it's the gentlest of kind of of letdowns for, for you know everybody kind of gets up and just oh, oh dear, brushes themselves off <laughs> yeah, and sort of walks so <laughs> even though bus has gone into a ditch you know and, and probably you know the, the at that time you know with with, with the seat belts in cars and things or not wearing seat belts people would have been th right through windscreens or mm. they'd have had steering columns puncturing through their chests you know so having a car accident was no small thing you know yeah, i can explain that though i can explain why they're so nonchalant about it <laughs> stiff up a lip mate stiff up a lip absolutely yeah you know it's so good. So good i mean you say this reminds me of a zombie film i, I this reminds me of like uh streets on a, a saturday night <laughs> <laughs> honestly and in the sense of like oh th this yeah. imagery is enough for a horror film in 1960 and yeah. oh, the standards they have fallen chaps they have fallen <laughs> oh god I, I i love it even more now that you that 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 we both thought of a zombie for different reasons, yeah. even more so now. So I, I do love that because yeah, I was just for, for me, it was the black and white. It was the, it was just the like the like just the general quietness of it all, uh, just mm. the, the lack of any sort of, just just the lack of any sort of life uh, going on. Obviously, I know in the film there it sort of takes place in the cemetery to begin with, but just the whole, yeah, the just the, just the, the, the I think just the imagery of it all, um, because obviously it wasn't a it wasn't a coloured film. I just yeah, mm. I got I got those I got those vibes. Uh, but like I say, I mean, I love the opening to this. I love the whole trying to figure out what was going on at the beginning. Um, I love the little tests that they were doing. I love them mauling things, and I just love how quickly they they got through it. Um, mm. Like it felt like I, I, again I'll say it again the film. So the risk of that <clears throat> excuse me the, the risk of that would be you might th things might get lost in, as the story goes on because you know you gotta sort of make those cuts but i felt like everything sort of tied in nicely um they didn't really leave anything i mean obviously th they were never going to sort of definitively figure out what was going on. it was always for speculation but they came back to it later uh, at a time where it was relevant to discuss and you got a little mm. bit more information as, as to sort of what was going on around that time when this particular village and sort of like other bits as well which i'm sure we'll we'll get into oh yes the other bits are very crucial um mm. to, well to, to my you know reading of it might be minor to other people but like, for me that was a crux of the film but we'll yeah we'll get on to that um they stinged us a tiny bit on one detail of how this happens but i'm not sure it's a bad thing um the, uh, the Wyndham novel lets you get a little bit of information from the ov overhead plane um, where uh, they do manage to take photos that give you some information. The plane notices a uh, silver object in the centre of the dome. 
um, or sorry, the centre of the area affected. Um, I don't believe they have that detail in this. No. Um, but I don't think we lose anything. I quite no. like the extra mystery, the step away yeah. from UFOs. Um, mm. It brings it into line with uh, the kind of sci-fi I love, like um, 19, the 1956 invasion of the body snatchers that steps away from UFOs and goes, mm. for, goes for an organic invasion. Um, yeah. Oh, and I'll see Fez is off. But I'll see you later, Fez. Have a good one. Um, and it's part of your involvement, isn't it? That that, that the disruption mm. is kind of it's it's kind of gentle but sudden and inexplicable, and then the level of jeopardy kind of just sort of dissipates, you know, as people wake up and return to normal. So, uh, mm. you know, it draws you in in that sense that uh, you know it could just be like, you know, any 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 day, you know, where you know, for instance, where you know he wakes up. Uh, in his study and then his wife comes in and at first it, it looks like she's a little bit shamefaced to admit oh I, I, I must have dropped off darling I must have nodded off mm. so mm. it's kind of the way in which the society tries to sort of overcome things with a kind of level of not exactly being casual but it's like oh something funny must have happened but it's not a disaster there's no nothing sinister going on it's uh you know it's just uh oh, must, must have dropped off you know there's an I innocent explanation I loved it he, he said it he said oh I, I, I woke up on. I woke up laying on the floor. Oh, <laughs> strange. It was the darndest thing. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's it. Yeah, it was the darndest. And I, and I just and I thought to myself, ah, not for me, it ain't. <laughs> but, but that's but that that's something I think actually is important. It's it, because mm. it, it does speak to something about there's an emblematic kind of uh, passivity of this society that that is going to be as we find in the film later. You know, going to be really severely mm. challenged, and it's going to have to find a way to respond. Mm. Quill clock. Um, I think the beauty of this is that we are given so little information that it could be anything. That's fact, it, yeah. The, the sort of religious angle did actually cause some trouble. I might as well say at this point, mm. uh, this did get censored by the BBFC. Uh, weirdly Boo. enough. Would you like to know what they had a problem yes. with? On what grounds, okay. yeah. They had uh, they haven't given a decent explanation, so I have got their official tome here. Uh, but it doesn't detail it. Uh, my other reliable uh, pre-68 horror, uh, Ivan Butler's horror in the cinema, has nothing on it. Um, but the details I found were that they didn't like the glowing eyes. And they said the really? glowing eyes had to be removed. Oh, uh, they God also sake. would not allow any blood uh, from the shooting uh, when the chap shoots himself. Mm. Oh, yeah. But, I mean, they moved, they went away from camera. I was absolutely... Oh. Yeah, the, but they they wouldn't allow the glowing eyes. That had to be removed for the initial uh, showing. America got it, but we didn't until that now. That is so dumb. For, for all I criticise the BBFC for, it's sort of for, for not putting the hammer down. Um, when they do, it can be over the weirdest things. That is, mm. that is mm. stupid. I mean... I know. <laughs> I, I literally have nothing to say to that other than that is the most ridiculous reason. But I think they have had a history of reading things at a very odd level. I remember listening mm -hmm. to a program years ago on the radio about um, censorship modes at the BBFC. And, and for instance, they ran down a list of, of sort of typical things that they objected to. And some of them could be quite odd conjunctions. And one of them I really stuck in my memory was they say, we will, we'll do things like we'll censor blood on women's breasts. Because yes. it's it's a too disturbing a conjunction of violence and you know wholesome uh, maternal uh, notions, um, and 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 the thing with the eyes, I'm not sure, but it's um, you know, it's uh, I may I don't maybe it's got something sort of uh, you know sub subliminally you know disturbing about it, the idea of these kind of these these blank almost corpse like eyes i don't know but but they do they definitely have a sense of you know there are certain sort of triggers for the little people and you know we can't we can't go near them even if they are kind of really very symbolic you know and um you know not exactly obvious to start with don't forget the lack of hip thrusting um yeah if, if you're showing you're pumping no thrusting amazing oh. Classics, classics. I can't. I, I'm uh, sorry. I can't. I can't get over that. The the eyes. The eyes thing. I mean, if anything, they should have been more more concerned with the haircuts. Oh no! I'd also point out just 
the amount of time that will have gone into doing that work. You can tell it was a difficult effect for them. Yeah. And yeah, then that time. And then some bugger comes in and just says, oh, no, cut that. <laughs> so much went into it. All right. Well, uh, one of one of the uh, big effects on this, and this is another thing that is absolutely stand out for me. Amazing. Loved it. It was so grounding is the effect that this visitation has of all the women of childbearing age getting preggers. Mm. Yeah, and it's not all good conflict. news is it <laughs> no see i you know i, I commented to my wife because um she, she was she was like milling about getting stuff done and i, I was i was watching this on my phone uh mm. and I, I sort of when this when this was all going on and it was all lovey-dovey and oh my god it's amazing and and i, I said to her i was like i think you'll really like this because it's so wholesome like the relationship these these two have got is so nice. It's 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 really heartwarming. And then it goes right into the next scene, and the woman who's like, "Oh my god, I didn't like, I I, I, I didn't I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything with anyone else." And you know, mm. I'm and this this doctor, by the way, amazing. He's either smoking a cigarette, asking for a cigarette, or <laughs> oh, reaching for. One. I love this guy. <laughs> I love it. Uh, yeah. Oh, great times, great times. Yeah, I, I know, don't. You, you, if we're praising um, uh, random uh, elements, um, did you catch the name of the screenwriter? Marble Light? Sterling Siliphant. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, absolutely amazing. The director is Wolf Rilla, a uh, German, and uh, Sterling Siliphant is the screenwriter. Absolutely loved it. I thought I had to mention that. Brilliant name. Oh, also... Desiccated Limbs, hey! Welcome. Welcome. I haven't seen you Welcome in back. ages. Good to see you, man. I hope um, we're covering Village of the Damned right now. I hope you like it. Um, I, re you know, if you don't want to watch it uh, spoiled, uh, you know, no worries. But it's a really good one. It's also on BitChute. But yeah, good to see you, man. Good to see you. Um, where were we? Yeah, I. So I yeah, just, the way the pregnancies manifest. Explored. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, please, Simon, go ahead, go ahead. No, 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 I was going to say, that, yeah, you say that there's the, the sort of three kind of emblematic moments that you've got um, Dr. Zellaby and Anthea, uh, and Anthea plays a little sort of, you know, suggestive word game with him about to let him know that he, uh, you know, she's pregnant, and he's, 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 you know, he's overjoyed, you know, and he has this sort of, you know, wonderful little, you know, um, thank you, darling, you've made my happiness mm. complete, all the more so because I'm old enough to appreciate it, because we're very very conscious that he's mm. you know he's a he's a bloke he's you know he, well, he's, he's george sanders is about 54 at the point mm. the film is made he's a, he's a sort of gray hair you know um uh, chap and uh, and she's obviously a very much younger wife um mm. you know very much her and 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 you contrast their sort of um taking it in their stride and feeling wonderful about it to the scene in the doctors where the young woman is she's distraught because i, it, I, I think it's heavily suggested she's a virgin i think isn't it yes i i just absolutely <laughs> adored the uh change in his manner it was so Henry. nice to see this other side of him when he just becomes doting on his wife it was so lovely you got the feeling that this was something actually he had wanted for ages mm. um and he'd given up on mm. and i just i loved that mm. Um, oh, whatever you do, horror show, do, 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 do I not cannot show that. that on screen. Oh, oh. oh. oh that is <laughs> disavow. Spitting truth. Dis Spit truth bombs. Spitting truth bombs, though. Um... <laughs> <laughs> disavow. Yeah, um, as, as you say, I, I got the impression here as well that this woman was a virgin. Um, uh, and y there's so much reading you do from this. This scene, this would not work today. Or this mm. would be, people would think, oh, what's the problem? What's so fuddy? Why are you so fuddy duddy about it? Um, in fact, you probably have to have a scene about them trying to, uh, well, trying to end the pregnancy, you know? Yeah, yeah. She's massively um, conscious of the social consequences. That's probably more so than mm. the, the the fear of having a baby, isn't it? That's and the yeah. doctor kind of is is you know sort of you know, shrugging it off, you know, with a fag in his mouth and maybe sort of slightly alluding to the fact that he might help her out 
in some way, although he mm. ostensibly oh, saying. Oh, did you get that vibe? I, I did a little bit, but I mean, he, the actual dialogue is that he's saying, you know, well, he'll do anything to help with the child, but you maybe get the sense that he might mm. be a little bit, uh, you know, uh, practiced in the dark arts and, uh, you know, mm. um, because, but then again, you know, who can I, say it's, it's left sort of ambiguous. I am just going to say, but it, it did surprise me that none of them to be worried those who were quote you know air quotes immaculately concepted um you know it, it it did sound a bit struggle snuggly as to as to what happened to them and there didn't really seem to be any concern about that but more of like what you said simon the 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 social implications of of that because mm -hmm. i know one of them uh, her husband was away for like a year uh mm -hmm. out, out at sea or, or, some, or something jim, like jim that. the sailor yeah that's yeah. it yeah you know he was away for he was away for a year so obviously he couldn't have fathered the child mm. uh, you know while while you'd understandably not think it was aliens or you know the devil or something along those lines um mm. the, the fact that this this documented ev event happened you, you wouldn't sort of go look you know jim okay this child might not be you yours but i can assure you i didn't say yes at the time so you know mm. perhaps police maybe oh, I, obviously not that they'd be able to work it out but yeah i just found it in that they were more worried about sort of social implications this, this, the stakes are definitely job. higher because 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 yeah. i think that is it the, the, the vicar says or the doctor says that three women mm. have tried to attempt suicide and yeah and, and some of them yeah. are out of their minds there's there is that really interesting scene again it would not happen uh today the doctor it's gordon zellaby and the vicar all talk to each other these are the pillars of the community and the the fact that the vicar is given a role that he takes his role so seriously it's just really interesting there's just another one of those things where the implications of of minor details are absolutely fascinating uh, like this woman's concern is is not as much how will I manage, how will I afford. It's what are people going to think of me? My reputation's yeah. going to be ruined. I yeah. I and, I love this stuff so much. This was the yeah. absolute best part of the movie for me. And it and it really does make sense because this takes place in a village. Mm. You know, the population isn't going to be big. Everyone's going to know everyone, you know, the, a, a small whip turn into widespread news within a matter of hours. So mm. the it, it's, it is perfectly legitimate for them to be like, what are they going to think of me? Yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not, it's not out of, um, it's not out of living memory. I mean, I was born just over 10 years after this film. And uh, when I was a child, I mean, um, you know, friends who, I mean, there weren't many, but friends who had uh, parents who were divorced, and if there was a divorced mother, mm -hmm. um, she was definitely still seen as a kind of scarlet woman and kind of ostracized. I and mean, I know it sounds odd now, but people were kind of, it felt like you were, you know, you, people would be sort of a bit suspicious because you were around a broken home in a way, and and, and single women with a very visible, um, you know, uh, debris of that. And people really, there was a social feeling about it. You know, people, you tend to sort of stay mm. away as if these people were slightly sort of deviant, you know. There was, am, am I right in thinking that sort of single parent households in that time would have very much been a stigma? Mm. Hugely, I think, yeah. Yeah, hugely. Uh, if you read Hitchin's Abolition of Britain, you'll get a very good uh, sense of that. Right. I mean, to, to date myself here, <laughs> I remember when... Don't laugh, don't laugh. When I was a child in the 90s, um, I can recall the sort of BBC very special episodes about divorce hmm. where it was handled as, you know, it was handled in the way they might handle, you know, little Jimmy shoot, shooting at methadone it, or, hmm. or Richard Bacon being fired for using cocaine. <laughs> it it right. was... It was a very big, serious, difficult issue. Yeah. Whereas shame. now it, it it is, I think they would just have your group of kids in the shows, and one of them would come from, um, you know, a family where there's been a divorce and uh, maybe a remarriage or what, what do they call it, a blended family, you know, and they wouldn't really comment on it. Mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, I remember my dad joking with me because he, he, you know, he'd made a joke about being a bastard and me, me just thinking, well, yeah, that's because you are. And he said, no, 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 no. <laughs> I was born, I was born out of a wedlock, you know, and people still mm. talked about that in, in those terms. And there was obviously something a little like shameful in the history that, you know, um, my grandmother, uh, you know, had my father and then she had a, succeed, a series of her, you know, her own children, if you know what I mean. So there's always a sense in which the, the, uh, the kid who was born out of wedlock was slightly cut adrift from the family. Uh, so, um, yeah, it was definitely, yeah, a, it was definitely a real thing. A real I, th thing. I, I, I think that was Gatsby just uh, saying that, that he was born a bastard child as well. It, it was, it was, um, tell you what, I have noticed it's after nine. I, I'm going to sneak out and do some chicken duty. So while we're all enjoying Gatsby's presence, I'll, um, I'll leave you, can I leave you guys to talk about how they handled the, uh, some of the difficulties with the early, early years of the children? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Excellent. Brilliant. Love it. <laughs> I, think, I think, I think there's also interesting elements actually, before we get into that, where, mm. you know, you've got the whole, um, you know, we, we, where the village is recovering, you know, and you've got the soldiers coming in. Mm. Um, you've got uh, the uh, the sort of whole procedural element of it that that, that that sort of builds a sense of that realism. And I think I read uh, somewhere that um, the director, Wolfgang uh, Rila, said, you know, uh, that, that he has a sort of documentary feel or very low-key mm. documentary manner was the quote I picked up from them. And it, it's got all of that thing of, you know, them coming in the sort of, you know, the chemical core and they're sweeping people with Geiger counters. And what it was, I found a lot of it very reminiscent. I don't know if you've seen it. Um, the Peter Watkins film, The War Game from 1965. It was very, very happened. similar in a way um, because Watkins does these kinds of sort of mock uh, documentaries, not comedy mock documentaries, but they're, they're essentially, um, you know, everyday life at, uh, you know, whether it's in a nuclear war or, or like he did in Culloden, you know, in a period of history, as if a camera crew is present, just mm -hmm. filming in a dispassionate way. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and it's, it's um, I mean, if you haven't seen the war game, um, you know, it's obviously about the onset of nuclear war in England and how it's handled at the kind of civil defense level. And it's quite, even though it's kind of low fi and, and it's a, it's a black and white, you know, period piece, you know, very, looks very similar to this in some ways. And it's, it's still quite horrific in the kind of the mundane, grimy quality that it yeah. has at the time yeah. um and the the thing about you know the the soldiers coming into the village is you know you see sort of zelleby kind of in his element you know and he's saying you know we've got to test everything you mm. know um the, it, it's it's kind of this thing of science is becoming this form of you know auditing and control and it's this yes. era of measuring society these people have to be kept under observation he says and it's it's an era where you know you've got things like the kinsey report on human sexuality oh, coming gosh, out yes yeah. yeah i mean he he gives does a thing of give me a year he's very much a yeah. planner he's a manager he's a he's a committee guy yeah, um, and it's it's very much it's very much directed towards a, a you know it's a kind of noblesse oblige of the old lord but it's invested in this new sort of science class mm. uh you know they're taking charge they're looking they're, they're breaking the problem down they're looking after people they're trying to organize society in this way and you know this this lends a sort of another character to you know what what could be a kind of in a way a sort of vision of a a, a hierarchical traditional society this is a new kind of character in some ways the kind of the guy who inexorably tries to sort of draw or drag the society towards progress as he sees it um and i don't think that's coincidental because you look at the background of um of wolf rilla the director he um he's quite interesting he he relocated from germany in the early 30s when it was becoming clear that you know germany was obviously going into a period of of, of authoritarian government as it would be seen then and um, he he's brought to England and he goes to this this school in Surrey, the Frencham Heights School, which is this progressive education. It's it, it was a part of a, what they call the pro progressive education movement from the mid nineteen twenties, and and the sort of people who came out of the school were very much your BBC type performers and and creative artists, um, and and so the kind of the kind of ideal is uh, idealization of, of of the scientific method and rationality is is kind of being sort of tapped lightly on the head here in this in this film 
in the way that you know you're establishing that you know society can be kind of measured and and you know um, and parameterized and and looked after uh, by this um, this kind of sort of not exactly technocratic approach but this sort of benevolent uh, uh, you know application of science. Um, and and that becomes something you know where there's a little bit of tension later on when you know he he meets Whitehall and uh, you know the the realities of, of of managing people and and you know avoiding panic and and stuff like that you know. Yeah. Am I on my own? <laughs> no, 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 no. You. <laughs> it's interesting, like sort of what you mentioned about it being sort of well, t talking about the documentary. Um, when I'm when I think about the, how, how this film is shot and, and how the scenes are played, it, it does feel very sort of documentary style, doesn't it? I mean, it, 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 it picks up at key points within the development of the children. Like it, it, it doesn't look at the, 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 the mundane stuff as such, but it will go, right. Okay. Here, we're going to bring you to this scene here where the, the, the mum's dipping her hand in boiling water. I'm assuming that is born in milk. I think, I think it was the milk actually. It was milk, wasn't yeah. It? yeah. The milk, the milk yeah. was too hot. I yeah. Think yeah. It was. Just, and you never really get an explanation as to what, what, what is the explanation for that? Because um, I know the baby like breaks breaks his bottle. It's David, isn't it? The baby Bre breaks his bottle. Uh, yeah, I think I think she said he's he's like he. She gave him the milk and it was too hot and he spat out the milk. But ah, I'm not quite then, sure then how she gets her hand burned. You know, as such, maybe yeah, as you say. I think he makes her put makes her, her hand in there. It's yeah. almost like punishment, like, you know, how dare you give me hot milk? How, how do you like it? Uh, he should have put his, should, although really he should have put a face in it, really, if he wanted her to taste it. But there we go. Um, yeah. And then, and then obviously you get, you, you pick up when uh, Sanders, uh, sorry, uh, Gordon, we're going with character name, is, um, <laughs> is showing uh, his brother in law the, like, that special box. And mm. obviously he, he takes a little while to open it and he's like, yeah, check this out. And then he gets David to, and David just like straight away. And then he's like, right now have a look. Yes. Uh, and then obviously all the other kids can do it. And, and you find out that, okay, we've learned something, all of the others. So they, they, they the theory that he's building and is supported is that, that, that they have some sort of hive mind. Mm. Um, I, I loved it when the kid, <laughs> when that when that little brat was like, "Oh, Evan, give me the box," and he's trying to open it, the kid's just like, mm. does a laser eyes. Um, I found I that just so believable as well. Just the, yeah, the kid would do that, and there's that sort of resentment that that kid had. Oh my god, know. my my if if my kids could laser eye each other when the other when when one of the others winds them up, mm. uh, <laughs> they would believe me. Um, but yeah, I I I found the technique as well how they did this was was quite interesting because it was like a freeze frame wasn't it that, that they did yes. to, to light the eyes up and i realized i realized that because obviously you've got the mom haven't you uh sort of like half of her face is in shot and you see her face freeze uh i'm, I'm a bit dumb so i, I might have not picked up if uh, if it wasn't for that but i thought that was quite an interesting way of doing it um, and i think it sucks that the bbfc ruined it for initial audiences over here because that, well, uh, that would have looked very if, weird. If it helps, we we didn't get the Frozen version, so I can talk about this a bit if you want. Ooh, okay. um, uh, this was an absolute pain in the bum to, to do. They did not have Adobe After Effects back in the day. They couldn't just do track point. Uh, although, in fairness, anyone who's used After Effects knows that you can't do track point because it never bloody works. <laughs> I'm not frustrated at all. Um they they had to do overlay shots this was painful to match so and they're having to do it frame by frame so what they did a lot of the time was cheat it by using a freeze frame and occasionally um they oh my gosh how's that for a call back that's brilliant i love that <laughs> what a comment harry and would not appreciate this but i think simon maybe this one is leaving you uh in the dark I, I don't know yeah probably but uh don't worry <laughs> no worries no worries um yeah so sometimes they did a split screen and they mm. had a frozen bit for the uh for the kid and then a, a moving bit else elsewise so classic split screen that you saw um all over the place back then and i uh, just i just marvel I'll at just the casting 
the, the casting of the kids, the two children in this sequence, though, the little blonde girl and the little blonde boy. I mean, what, what mm. you know, um, central casting for evil kids did they use? Uh, the, the, they, sort of... they found it. I mean, I've got a, a lovely one of them in a group. I mean, this is one that tends mm. to come up a lot. And sorry, Simon, I hope I didn't embarrass you. Yeah, no, 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 no. I was just praise of the he, voice. He, <laughs> mm, mm. It's he, worth he, highlighting. Even even just that sort of short sequence, you know, with the two sort of you, you know toddlers, um, you know, but they they got some really malevolent looking children. They really yeah. have even just little ones. There's something about, um, so the the boy on the furthest left, I think those just slightly piercing eyes. Uh, they did uh, give them slightly padded wigs to make it appear as their heads were just slightly deformed just slightly too large and uh, i thought yeah. that was a really good decision but the kid the children just have this wonderful coldness to them um i'm sort i'm sort of convinced that the two kids on either extreme left and right actually are you know related they look very similar and mm -hmm. i actually thought they were boys in in girls wigs it's possible uh, they do do that. Um, so, well, they frequently do it the other way round uh, mm. to you know, like cast older girls as uh, younger boys. Mm. Um, people are saying this, so we might as well discuss it. Um, uh, referencing Omen and Children with Corn is correct, but actually, I think it was John Gorris. I don't know if he's still in the chat, John. You mentioned the key film to reference, which is The Bad Seed, which I think came out at least four years earlier here. Okay. Um, it's not the first one where we have an example of uh, what we would call pedophobia or fear of children. Um, if you're nerding out a bit and want to read more on that in cinema, it's actually the topic of Mark Commode's thesis. Um, but obviously the spooky kids uh, is big business. It's a very popular thing, even though it comes with um, certain difficulties like you have to get a child who can act. Um, well, yeah, I mean, for this film, I don't really think that was important that the children could act because they, they, I found them to be very wooden anyway, mm. which I felt worked quite well with the type of characters they were portraying. So, I mean, that, yeah, that, that was quite well, that, that worked quite well for me. With regards to uh, David, though, the, um, the young boy, did they did they dub his voice? I swear that that mm, wasn't mm. his actual voice. Mm. Yeah, I suspect it was a, a, a young female actress, um, like we had with in Method of Ma um, in the Mouth of Madness as well. I think it's right. pretty typical often to overdub young children with um, with mm. actresses. Mm. Yeah, it was very yeah. very out of place. But then I think again that sort of adds to the to the theme of the film because you know, these children are very out of place. So, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it made it very uncanny. But, um, obviously, because they're children, you, what you can actually do to them in terms of horror is also quite limited. Um, but that doesn't really come in here because this film is pretty tame in terms of violence, or, or rather extremely tame, I would say, to be honest. Mm. Um, they had some issues because of uh, uh, sort of Catholic opposition to this idea of a uh, virgin birth. Um, right. That raised some some understandable issues. Um, but then it seems just overall they've been very, very hesitant in what they're doing. I think possibly because it's a British production. And the British... Um, the British studios, were, from what I can tell, were never pushing the line the way the American studios were. We've always had this sort of tension that our rating systems are mismatched. And right. the Americans have, have their, um, their R rating, which is either a 15 or an 18. And I found that's tended to push for slightly stronger 15s. Okay. I have no way of quantifying this whatsoever. It's yeah. purely my feeling that effectively the the boundaries of the American certificates have uh, been a big influence pushing our certificates up. I think it's the context of American laws, I understand it. I mean, I can relate this to 
um, discussions about things like stand-up comedy in the 60s, people like Lenny Bruce, mm. where there was the question of the obscenity laws, and he was prosecuted under obscenity laws, obviously, uh, and, and made, made a sort of case, uh, you know, a cause celebre uh, out of that in his career later on. And if one of the sort of key def defining parameters of the obscenity laws in the US is that which does not necessarily violate the standards of the community. And of course, if, if life is a little bit more, you know, um, <laughs> it's probably a bit more developed or edgy in America in the standards of the community, if you like. On the one hand, they could be more puritanical, but they could also be um, aware of and exposed to, you know, perhaps a slightly broader range of behavior than might have existed in the UK at that mm. point. So that the idea of, you know, decency or, you know, um, the parameters in, you know, film, if you like, perhaps were a little bit more liberalized in America where, you know, I mean, it, it wouldn't be uncommon to to see perhaps, you know, acts of violence or at least to see the reporting on acts of violence, you know, uh, that uh, that came out uh, of the culture, you know, in, you know, if you consider things like the way that people like, you know, Ouija, the crime photographer would, uh, you know, uh, do his kind of sort of weird, grotesquely elegant pictures of crime scenes that, you know, might feature in the newspaper in America and, and people might not, you know, see it as quite such a, a challenging thing. Whereas I think in Britain, we probably have tended to be much more coddled and, and restricted. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, you know, for, for, you know, for want of a, you know, a, 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 an amendment, uh, you know, governing, uh, governing free expression and, you know, the journalistic side of, uh, of things so that, you know, perhaps that's why we're always kind of tending to be led by, you know, America's greater exposure to a wider range of phenomena, uh, mm. and, and, and that then, then sort of inflecting our, our ability to, you know, broaden our tastes. There is a there is a trap about uh, sort of superficial uh, visual similarities between um, America and England mean that often you don't tend to, you don't tend to think of them as different cultures and that allows a bleed. Um, it might be an interesting thing to note now. Uh, what you talked about the values of the community does actually very much still apply. Um, I don't have cause to talk about it much but so I might as well mention it here there's a really interesting strand about how the BBFC rates Bollywood movies and for all that I've said there you know incredibly light touch my goodness they crack down on Bollywood um the standards applied to Bollywood films are like 40 years ago it's a kind of thing where a kiss will be uh, rated like massively uh, more strongly entirely on the basis that the BBFC is taking it as read that basically only an Indian audience um, will be watching Bollywood and they will assume that that is a more conservative more traditional audience and they will not want to see passionate kissing um, there's some really interesting stuff on this uh, on the BBC website about it, about how they just, they're much more restrictive with their ratings of, of those movies. Wow. Uh, yeah, <laughs> universalism um, uh, does not apply in that case. <laughs> so what we can infer from that is the uh, the BBFC are racist. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think... They don't, uh, they don't like Indian is... people kissing. That's, that's, that's just... Oh. Why, why haven't they you been cancelled? Why can't we have censorship-free videos... <laughs> let's do it. Let's let's get the BBFC cancelled. Let's get them censored so that we can have some censorship free bloody movies. Oh man. Let's do it. When let's we do, do the censorship discussion, it's gonna be a fun one. <laughs> <laughs> but it is interesting, isn't it? That we will we will apply your community standards on your behalf. It, it's an interesting one. Whereas well, I won't get dragged into it because <laughs> many BBFC histories have talked about this. Um Right, so oh, we're talking about the uh, the children, the design of the children, and their slightly um, slightly albino look. How it's so effective! Oh, we we also um, we may have skipped over it a bit, but I just I do feel I should mention that the scene with the puzzle box in which Celebi uncovers their ability. Um, again, it's part of the thing I really love: people testing the premise. Um, and this is Zalabi at his strongest. I'm going to criticise him quite a lot later, but this is him 
being wonderful and owning it and his methodology actually coming out ahead. I think it's fair to say. Right. Yeah, I mean, he he, he very much views the children as as, as, as some sort of experiment. Mm. Um, and you find out a little bit later on as well. I love it. It's what it's just one sentence that that perfectly encapsulates his relationship with David. Um, when the brother-in-law, I believe it is, mentions something about it's like uh, your son, and he and he goes, I can't remember the I can't remember his wife's name now. Uh, what's her it's, name? Oh, I never remember the names. It is Anthea, played by Barbara Anthea. Shelley. Quite that's right. Quite the renowned actress in these. And, and he just and and he just says. Anthea's son there's no proof to suggest that he's mine and mm. i was like yeah he's yeah he doesn't he doesn't view uh, it doesn't view him as his child you, uh, mm. as, a, as a science project if you will what he wants to learn from them he doesn't have a an, an emotional attachment to the child or to, to, to his child let alone the other children mm. it's purely what can i learn from these children how can they benefit us Yes. Yeah, I just, it's just that, but it's just that one sentence, you know. Whereas, con, you know, and 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 the funny thing is, the children seem to respect him more than, say, Anthea, who is very mothery, very, very mothering, very doting on David, and he just has no interest whatsoever. Fact doesn't contact with her, shows no, sh shows no sort of um, emotional uh, emotional reliance or or. or there's just no love there mm. like when when he's packing his suitcase to go to the to go to the school and she's like you know can i help and he's like i'm old enough to do it myself and yeah cuts his finger and he's like she's like oh my god let me let me look at that and he's like stop he just doesn't care contrast that to the dad potentially not definitely not who doesn't care and yet they they seem to respect him more what seems to be interesting, and uh, I was going to delve deeper into it, but I need I need to actually watch the darn show to confirm it. Um, in the remake, and by the way, guys, I could be massively wrong on this. If I am, disavow, disregard, I'm an idiot. Um, but I watched the trailer for the new series, the remake of this, and uh, they've gender swapped uh, the main character, so... Um, you know, Gordon Zellaby is now played by, I think, Keely Hawes. Um, fine. But um, it being done in modern Britain, the uh, the children here are all diverse. Which what? I th yeah. Now, that, that I found was absolutely... F Again, if, the tr if I am wrong based on the trailer, correct, um, disregard... Um, I, I should have looked this up, but I just watched the trailer a couple of times. And it seems to be that you have um, what they would say, uh, children are representative of the community. And I just found that very odd because oh my the God, whole that, point that, that, of this is the Midwich Cuckoos. Yeah. Um, and that, I, that, that's... Go ahead. I'm sorry, I'm just saying that's so daft, you know, because mm. isn't the whole point of these kids, like they're, they're meant to look and and behave exactly well they're meant to look exactly like each other or or you know look very close to mm. each other um yeah. it, like they even mention it when they talk about the events that happen in other countries and you know they mention like the s it happened to eskimos yeah. and like they all came out white and like with blonde hair and they were like you know the the, the brown the brown eskimos weren't happy with that it's it's, it's like that, that's the they're not meant to represent the community they're out they're, they're clearly outside of it yes like you can you can okay fine look if you want to diverse them up fine but you know one group one group because uh, you've got to make yeah. it it would be it'll be like having the borg and having and having borg you know obviously like you know they they mishmash from other from other you mm. know, alien races and stuff like that but i mean in terms of the physical makeup once they've been assimilated you know they are strikingly similar to each other yeah but if you had borgs that just look completely different from one another and all like yeah yeah by the way we we all think this is our strength you, you you're contradicting yeah it's, it's, it's a contradicting a, message i mean it seems like actually 
literally politics aside, you, you can make it work. It seems to me that if you are a very progressive, you can actually make the homogeneity of the cuckoos really work in your favour. And, you know, I do try and be fair on this. I think you could make an amazing progressive horror out of this. Like the idea, imagine you've got this very diverse community um, and suddenly every, you, you're having this kid who just looks so unlike you. There is a horror in that. And there's a, yeah. very, there's a powerful horror in it that is quite rich. Um, and the tension of like how much ownership and connection you should feel to it. Um, yeah. And if, if, if some people have less of that because a kid looks a bit more like them, that's an interesting source of tension that a good writer could do a heck of a lot with. Yeah. I mean, they if they, if they really want to do sort of like, uh, you know, if they, uh, you know, wh whatever you think about sort of like representation in, in movies and media is, mm. uh, I, I don't really pay much attention to it. But with regards to, you know, if they, if they wanted to sort of do a sort of village of the damned, but have that sort of representation, dude, like, this movie gives them the opportunity to do it because they talk about stuff going on in Australia, M Mongolia, mm. uh, like <laughs> I say, the bloody Eskimos. Like, yeah. <laughs> do a spin-off and, and tell us and, and show us and show us what happened to the kids when the Eskimos found them. Like, <laughs> do it that way. I really hope they do because that would be amazing. That would be some dark you know? horror. Um, yeah. Simon, do you have a take on this? Mm. Or I do. Or maybe, or, uh, or, or, sorry, yeah. I'm sorry, sorry, just, or just you I have an you. idea. North Sentinel Island. Oh, my, oh no. Do it there. <laughs> oh, dearie me. Um, Simon. On. Yeah, I mean, it's it's funny. I guess we're getting sort of into the sort of meat of the film now. I mean, I had, um, uh, like last time, I took like seven pages of notes on the film and sort of came mm. up with two kind of strong themes running through it. I mean, basically the way I see the film, because of where it comes in time, um, it, it, to me, it's basically, it's, it's intertwining a couple of things. It's, it's one, it's about the anxiety of a society, a society that's living in the shadow of the bomb. Mm. And the other element to me is what you often hear, hear referred to as the birth of the teenager. Um, it's, it's, mm. it's a point where culturally you've got this accession of a new kind of tribe um, within, you know, let's say England and, and the West, um, you find there's an awful lot of anxiety right from the, 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 the early to mid 50s onwards about this new species, the teenager. And that's what you're kind of getting here, this this sense of a, you know, a precocious new breed. It all wants, they all want to sort of dress the same way, do the same things. They want to be their own, you know, society within society. And you you can find a sort of a kind of a rich and interesting sort of survey of, uh, you know, um, concern about this, just looking over the, you know, the British press. I mean, I was really struck by um, just looking over some old stuff from uh, the mid 50s, um, the, the, the letters column in the Daily Mirror. And I found that this this little article, it was uh, Mrs. G of Lemington was writing into the Agony Aunt. And it, it's it's basically concerns about, you know, her teenager turning into a terror. You know, and she says, my son, who was 14 a month ago, used to be reasonably obedient and straightforward. He confided in me and we were best of friends. This last year, he's been steadily changing. He's cheeky and he's sulky. Why should a boy change like this? Do you think he's got into bad company? I'm ever so worried in case he becomes one of these delinquents we read so much about. And and the, the, the sort of clickbait of the headline is, he's sulky and cheeky. He's a changer. Is bad company to blame? Um, so there's this ever present sort of concern that, you know, um, the, the, the sort of um, society of, of the pre-war period is now being interrupted by this, 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 this sort of new convergence, this social convergence of, 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 a, of a, a group of people who before the war, before sort of, you know, child labor laws changed, they would have been kind of out to work pretty much. You know, kids, kids mm. would be could be in jobs from quite you know, early on. You know, um, and we all we've all sort of heard, you know, grandparents stories about, you know, when they were kids, they would like, there'd be, you know, yep, quite young kids working in jobs. I mean, we all know about chimney sweeps and stuff in the Victorian mm -hmm. period. But at this point now, you've got this, this, this the, the child labor laws change. And, and there's this period now between childhood and adulthood, this this adolescence where you've got 
these anxieties emerging about what is quite a disruptive force. And you, you know, you look you look through you know, uh, the, the sort of papers in the in the 50s, and you see that they're sort of trying to find a way to understand this. It's almost as if for some people, it, it almost looks as if, you know, they've never actually had the teenager as we know it, the kind of, you know, if we go for an extreme caricature, Kevin, the stroppy teenager, <laughs> this, this idea of this temperamental kind of willful, um, surly kind of creature is something that's emerging is actually relatively new in this mm -hmm. period. And, and at the same time, as I say, I tie that against also the um, the 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 very the very kind of um, fertile decade between the end of the war and, and 1960, where you know you're 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 sort of in this kind of early to mid period Cold War, uh, and and you've got all sorts of you know you've got U.S. atomic testing going on. Uh, and you've got this this sense that's coming through in the news of these these things are really changing our world, you know. Mm -hmm. um, the, there's uh, there's I mean there's things like I mean this maybe is going to sound very obscure in relation to this film, but people are very conscious of certain of these big science and and nuclear events. I mean, 1954, you have something called Operation Castle Bravo, where they accidentally <laughs> they accidentally detonated a 15 megaton bomb. Now it was only supposed to be five megatons. Right, and this was near the Bikini Atoll, and and it, it, you know they sort of did the calculations wrong, you know. So it was actually three times the the the, the strength. I mean, it was it was about a hundred times more powerful than the bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and there was a major fallout incident um, in in the region of it, where the bombs were detonated near Bikini, and 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 in particular, there was one incident where it uh, the fallout. Um, uh, actually landed uh, or affected a Japanese fishing boat called uh, the Lucky Dragon Number no. Five, and hmm. uh, it was one of the first incidents of radiation poisoning because one of the lucky crewmen... dragons one to four were yeah, not so well, lucky. Not so lucky. Um, and 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 one of the guys on the boat died from radiation poisoning mm. or sickness associated with it, and and the others were affected. Uh, and one of the crew members had a, had a deformed, stillborn child. So it's no this way. idea that this this new mm. technology is the stuff is affecting the kids, you know. And and of course that that particular incident actually, um, the Lucky Dragon Number no. Five went on to uh, inspire a film called Godzilla, which um, you know we obviously know wow. as, as Godzilla. Well, I, so, I was going to say it's something we we pass over, but yes, um, the the impact the cultural impact of nuclear yeah. bombs is massive in this in this uh, period uh, obviously uh, yeah. godzilla but also the day stood still sorry the day the earth yeah. stood still yeah uh, also uh, has that fear any and even in popular culture i mean you know you've got obviously 1956 you know it's all rock around the clock and stuff and and at that time you know elvis mm. uh, is coming up and he's doing shows in las vegas and he's literally marketed as uh, america's atomic powered singer um, and, and you can go to, and this is an interesting thing I found out about Las Vegas, they, they actually created this atomic tourism because the Nevada testing grounds were within sight of Las Vegas. So you could actually go and at about dawn is when they would detonate the small atomic tests. And you would basically see in the distance, the, the sky would flash and you would see a small mushroom cloud come up. So again, they were tying it into a kind of excitement of the age. Um, mm. Uh, and at the same time, you know, you're living with this 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 anxiety about well, what what is it doing to us? Uh, I mean, I think Anthea says about these babies. You know, she said, "What sort of life is it going to have?" Um, you you're on some really strong stuff here. Um, mm. If we're taking the E. Michael Jones route, that horror is a result of our subconscious fears coming to the surface and seeking expression. You already highlighted how it's post-war. It's a time of sort of social crisis and change. Um, and we've already seen ideas of um, unmarried pregnancy, um, infidelity, you know, the father's come back from the war and uh, his wife's up the duff. Yeah. yeah. Um, that already builds into what we're seeing. And there's if there's a subconscious fear coming out, definitely the birth of the teenager, but may maybe even just a very simple, the loss of authority. Adults have lost their authority in this world. You've got um, basically a huge gap um, of male authority. And, I mean, would these children be the boomers? Would, would these be ba uh, baby boomers in their child form? 
effectively yeah effectively yes i mean uh you know i mean uh you know yeah the, the, these are you know i mean the baby boomers are effectively starting after 1945 so this is the period where the boomers are you know are entering the teenage period they're about 15 uh 15 to 17 mm. um, do you think also a fact of i okay this could be a really stupid idea it's just come to me so shout me down if i'm off i'm almost wondering about what's the effect of sort of mass evacuations to the countryside from the city kids and them coming back is there an element of that in this i mean that, repeat that. it's mass hmm. uh, so this is yeah. massively displaced in time yeah but I, i'm just wondering about this this aspect of sort of the countryside kids yeah coming to face with the urbanized kids um yeah the kids the, from this advanced civilization yes that, which that effectively we're suspecting. the city is you know yeah 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 i'm wondering if that's in there i, I think i think there is something and, and actually as i think i think someone was saying um earlier there's sort of occultish elements as well um mm. i mean maybe this maybe this is going to sound a reach but i mean i'm i'm leaning very heavily on actually a book a really interesting book called uh, welcome to mars by ken hollings who um, he? It's subtitled "Fantasies of Science in the American Century," and what it is, it's it's a great sort of um, uh, you know kind of uh, book for understanding how you know um, the 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 science and the the militarization and technology of the age was refracted through popular culture, and uh, and there's something I picked up from him actually in this that you know there's this element in the story of uh, it, it's it's a monstrous birth. You know these children it's almost like something from a kind of dark memory of the middle ages in some way and mm -hmm. this this idea has a sort of occultic resonance as well because you've got um in the early 20th century you've got uh, you know, people maybe familiar with people like alistair crowley uh mm -hmm. you know who who had this sort of neo-religion called telema um and the, this thing he came up with telema has this active principle quotes um of to will to wish want or purpose uh, and uh, and that kind of expresses in a sense what these kids are about they're kind of emotionless but they just exercise pure willpower kind of the will yeah. to sort of dominate to conquer mm. um and there's, there's other elements of this um this sort of sort of religious philosophy that that crowley came up with the other couple of tenets tenets of it that i, I learned was that um quote every man and every woman is a star so he saw people as kind of beings of light yeah. Okay. And oh, in and the also, Luciferian sense, maybe. Indeed, indeed. Uh, and 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 also, there's this concept of, of of love is the law, but love under will. So it's the idea that love is subsidiary uh, to finding uh, and and pursuing one's authentic mm -hmm. mission on on Earth. You know. Um, and the interesting thing about Crowley is, of course, um, he he died uh, in 1947. He became this kind of rattled old junkie living in Hastings. Um, <laughs> but before he went, he was in correspondence with a guy called Jack Parsons in America. Now, Jack Parsons was a rocket scientist at uh, Cal Caltech, California, California Institute of Technology. And he was a principal innovator in the U.S. rocket program. And mm. so there's this interesting convergence between this interest in the occult and nuclear weapons technology. And, and they were both engaged in this correspondence, which is really interesting and kind of freaky, about um, Crowley had written in 1917 a book called Moonchild. And um, what had happened is this guy Parsons had taken on these ideas of Crowley, and he was trying to, quote, create a moonchild in his home in Pasadena by, by employing kind of, you know, occult magic. Mm. Um, and um, this idea is that you know, in, the, in the novel is a moon child is is a creature that's sort of you know impregnated into a, a you know a human woman by an ethereal force, and it's something that will come to you know uh, you know improve the human race, you know, kind of like an, a, a gift from the stars in some way. Mm. And um, and the whole thing is kind of sort of as I say, it's tied together with this sort of you know this 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 weird occult stuff, and and the kind of very sort of odd people who were, who were sort of involved with the US sort of missile program at the time. And funnily enough, another guy who was involved with um, this guy, Jack Parsons, who was helping him on this project to create a moon child. And you, you very much kind of think of it, you know, these kids could be like that, the, the moon child. The other guy who was involved in this project was one L. Ron Hubbard. So, uh, no way. 
What a connection. So, he, so there's, as I say, I, I, I have a look at that book by Ken Hollings, Welcome to Mars. He, he draws Welcome a lot of these fascinating, it. very well-researched connections about this kind of, as I say, these many convergences between all of that, between the kind of sort of interventions that, uh, you know, the, the nascent CIA were running in terms of, and people hear about projects like MK Ultra and stuff like that, mm. but where there was, there was attempts to kind of intervene in culture um, to sort of convey a progressive vision of science. And at the same time, they were dealing with a lot of the post-war anxiety as well. Mm. And then it was coming out in the expression of these things like, like science fiction films, which of course the 50s was a massive um, sort of springboard for that genre. Yeah, def uh, and I mean, definitely. The, you've just seen atomic bombs go off. You've, you've already gone through massive industrialization. So your, your idea is what science science is going to change everything but it's also a su source of anxiety yeah. um I, i'm gonna shoehorn it in since we you kind of mentioned it uh it's a it's a trickier topic um well when you say post-war anxiety mm. do we read any post-war anxiety in these um young blonde uh blue-eyed kids in the oh. nice oh. short shorts we... there because I got massive I push. Go I thought mm. I got massive mm. pushback on this when I said I thought there was a lot of that uh, mm. in the deliberate casting of a German for Peeping Tom. Mm -hmm. um, mm. And that's fine. People don't have to be convinced. But I'm. We, we've already seen there's so much going into this. It doesn't have to be there. But I did wonder. I Are you talking about the sort of very obvious kind of, you know, Aryan kind of, uh, or Aryan kind of, uh, you know, look of the I kids? I do wonder if they are coded Aryan, uh, yeah. Aryan I should say, uh, because I, I think that was massively influential in Peeping Tom specifically. I think they went out of their way to do that. Uh, and you can obviously understand uh, the producers of that film would be very motivated of the time. In this one, it's less of an obvious collection. You do have a German director, yeah. um, and all German creators at this time, you know, uh, it's heavy on the conscious. I think I've mentioned Margarita von Trotter a few times, um, who really puts that into her films, increasingly subtextually, but she does include it. Um, yeah, I just I mean, feel it's very fresh, you know, this idea yeah. of a collective and a collective will. Well being well, this, imposed this is an interesting thing and i think those ideas are kind of very much in a sense yeah the, the you know absorbed much as you know people like Werner von braun the 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 german rocket scientist was mm. absorbed into the u.s um you know effort for for dominance uh, against the soviet mm. union and um you know there's there's obviously again the anxiety that we're talking about is also the you know it's the world of of spookdom as well where you know as they say it's it's what isn't said is just as important as what is said and one of the the big paranoid um kind of projects of the time is the idea that you know the soviets have developed um systems for what they call automatic obedience um so you had um the cia investing quite heavily in the early 50s i mean they had something called project artichoke um which was a, a funding research uh, into into all sorts of areas, you know, um, things like, you know, hypnosis and electroshock therapy. Um, they were looking at the use of things like UHF sound waves to alter brain patterns. And, and they had the development of something called an amnesia ray. And and there was one particular program they had, which was, um, let's make, let me get the quote. It was the search for and development of exceptionally gifted individuals mm -hmm. who can approximate perfect success in ESP performance. And uh, they were encouraging um, their, the CIA were encouraging their agents to follow all leads on individuals reported to have true clairvoyant powers, and subject them to rigorous scientific investigation. Well, that's Dr. Zellerby right there. Mm. Uh, this idea that there's this there's this new mysterious force, and we can harness this. Um, you know, I mean, of course, there's a lot of projection onto the Soviet Union as well. This idea that, well, again, we don't know what they've got, so it means they must have something really amazing. And there was a lot of effort put into sort of the idea of mind control drugs and, and you know, uh, programs to, you know, as it were, um, you know, they, they kind of often saw the mind as something like a tape recorder. 
you know, and, and, and if they could mm -hmm. only learn the ways to manipulate it, you know, could they wipe people's personalities or could they program them? Well, uh, we can't have a mind control gap any more than we can have a mind shaft gap. Exactly. Um, I, I, you I, are making me think of the Manchurian candidate there. Mm -hmm. uh, also uh, released around the time. Am I remembering right? Frank Sinatra was in that. Am I way off on that? I've, I've got no idea. Let me have a look. Okay. Also, you mentioned uh, Werner von Braun, and I should probably mention that um, 1962, uh, the Manchurian candidate, um, I don't think it's going to, I'm probably, uh, oh, sorry, that's the book. Apologies. Well, well, okay. Oh, I was no, that say, was um... also 1962, and it does star Frank Sinatra and Janet Lee. Oh, my goodness, I, I might have to watch this. Um, um, I just want to play devil's advocate mm -hmm. for a moment because I do think because because if I'm if I'm honest I think the uh, mustache man uh, imagery with regards to the appearance of the children given given that you know what, we were only 15 years since the end of the Second World War mm -hmm. and uh, everybody knew what um, mustache man's uh, ideal appearance. Of a of a of a the ideal human would would look like mm. would probably resonate through this film, uh, and I think you know nowadays I think it would be more subconscious. Well, it probably wouldn't, but um, especially well, especially in like the fifties and sixties, I think it would have been more prominent because you know they they were not far removed from that. Um, mm. My devil's advocate position though would be this would have been a black and white film, and so they wouldn't have really been able to. It, they wouldn't have been able to um, present the, you know, using a whole wider range of colors because they would have been limited to very few. So using True. bright white hair and, you know, beaming white eyes uh, is probably just an artistic approach to make it look more prominent, perhaps make it look more threatening, more, more daunting. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the practical approach, I think. Well, speaking of threatening and daunting, I will leave you to discuss what the children do in the scene that gets everyone a bit worried. No, oh, this is mental. Back in a minute. Mm. So, so in this scene, they're they're walking to the they they're going to the boarding. Well, I say boarding school. Let's just call it boarding school for now. And um, the driver of that car is um, that's Jim's brother. The so this, this is. Um, Sailor Jim, who thinks his wife has been unfaithful earlier. Yes. And, Correct, and he's yeah. got uh, his, his brother, who we only see in a short scene at the beginning. Um, he's kind of admiring this camera that he's got, uh, which mm. is uh, you know kind of super advanced uh, for the time. And and it's apparently, yeah, it's him. And he, he, he almost runs over one of the little girls in the group, doesn't he? That's right, yeah. It's almost like he slams right into her and she just sort of like stops the car. Yeah. It's really weird. And I, I thought, ah, oh, superhuman strength. But again, they don't really mention it. I think it's just maybe just poor editing. But yeah, mm. so he gets out and he's like, oh my God, are you all right? Like he's, he seems genuinely concerned. And then the children sort of gather around the, the girl that he hit. And then they do the whole white eyes thing. And uh, he hops back into his car, turns the engine on, and then proceeds to go straight into the wall. And the explosion from mm. the car was hilarious as well. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. yeah. And. And, and all the while you've got um uh An anthea anthea is just kind of looking on it's aghast just, yeah and they all sort of look at her and then in the next scene that it's almost like that it's like a town meeting isn't it almost it's like, like an, it's an inquest they're, they're yeah. holding an inquest over his death um yeah and and, and she's up there giving testimony and and, uh, and, and you feel of... telling the story as if they're sort of almost are they doing something to her, her. mind? Yeah. 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 It's very hard to tell whether she was, yeah, whether they were mind controlling her to say those things to, to, to keep, to protect them or, or whether she was really struggling internally to try and defend them and, you know, questioning the morality behind that, whether, you know, whether she should have said something at that point. But I, I don't know about you, but I, I tend to sort of lean on the idea that they were mind controlling her to say those things. Mm, yeah and, mm. and then you have at that point jim uh the sailor uh, the surly mm. sailor uh snaps and and outright accuses the kids of, of you know wielding this power and and you're in this very interesting point in the film i think there's this um 
you know, I've, I've sort of mentioned it a few times before, but, you know, people may be familiar with this, this notion of hypernormalization. Of course, there's the Adam Curtis film about it from a few years ago, but the idea that in the Soviet Union, that people got to the point where they knew that the, the system was, was, was wrong, fake, corrupt, you know, it wasn't working, um, yeah. but the, that they were meant to believe certain narratives in public. And everybody sort of went along with it. And you get that feeling yeah. that it's almost like that in the village, that it's got mm. to the point where everybody kind of knows that these freaky kids are exerting this sort of dangerous, sinister power, but but they're just kids. So so how can you do anything? <laughs> yeah. That that is sort yeah, of it. one of the the trickiest, spiciest bits of this film. And may, maybe we'll have to get onto this now. Um it's such a rich yeah. film, I figured we'd We'd get on to it eventually also. Hello, Gatsby. Yeah. Uh, the, the Alabaster knows it with that scene. It, it does look like she was struggling mm. against their mind control. Yeah, agreed, agreed. Um, but also, I think that a lot of people didn't want to admit it. They, you know, they're happy yeah. to let the... to have the frog boiled. Um, is is cognitive dissonance the right word, perhaps? Yeah, definitely. Mm. It's um, mm. They're invested as well, like uh you know you're having cognitive cognitive dissonance from resisting it you know what uh resisting what you uh know just uh just is the obvious fact mm. but and fear of the change you know um but also tension because you know they're sort of your kids but also they're not mm. and i mean this might be one of the more divisive bits of this stream but this is an in this for me is a really interesting thing that makes Village of the Damned very challenging for modern audiences and sensibilities. And this is the fact that we learn that Midwich was not the only place to get uh, a visit and to have mm. the children. Um, there were four others. So there was an Inuit community, I think they say, Inuit or Eskimo that they say. They say Eskimo, yeah. Eskimo, right, good. We'll go with that. Um, Mongolian, Northern Australian, and... The North, Ra Northwest Russia. Northwest well. Russia, thank you, yeah. that was it. Yeah. Yes. Now, um, I mean, I, I'll, I'll maybe just do this quickly. Uh, Northern Australia, they didn't survive. Um, the temperatures i presume were not right hmm. but interestingly the inuits sorry the eskimos and the mongolians have no moral compulsions they saw an outsider group and they dispatched them quickly yeah russia had to manure used its force to wipe out the village when they saw some when they mm. basically realized it was not good presumably well, initially, initially they all the babies all the, they, they, all the babies in northwest russia survive and they start mm. giving them a high education mm. but but and then as you say they it's the what's the village of Reminsk, i think they say yeah they um, also try to use them yeah. they try and benefit yeah. from them too but i think mm. they they are less sentimental about it is what i get yeah. yeah, well, they and, mentioned, didn't they, when because they had to, they basically had to nuke the town, mm, pretty yeah. much because and, when and they that, sent troops in there, the the, the 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 kids just made the troops all shoot shoot each other. So they were like, we, we and, can't. And when? Sorry, sorry, TCG, go on. Saying that that they 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 couldn't physically go in there to take to take on the children like mm. uh, head to head mm. because the children just used their mind mind powers just to get rid of the soldiers. So they decided the next best thing to do was to nuke the entire city. Yeah. Oh yes, they deny. They have a cover story, but they have never let the less they acted. They used force, mm. and mm. it is the very challenging aspect of this film is that it is showing that the liberal society is yeah. very weak mm. in this respect. The setups of the liberal presumptions which do in many cases grant great strengths, also carry with them great weaknesses. There is a very obvious truth that they have been invaded by a weird outside force. 
Mm. And the Mongolians and Eskimos have absolutely no problem instantly dispatching. Mm. Mm. And, and, and this is the interesting point in the film, isn't it, where you're having, they're, they're having the discussion in Whitehall with the, with the Home Secretary and and you know they're finding these stories about about these uh, these other colonies of kids and and they are colonists i mean i think they say mm, themselves later they do. Colonists. Mm. and and you know you've got tam um, zellaby coming out as you say with this sort of classic liberal position in a way he's saying you know what we're dealing with here is a mass mind it's an entirely new development these children all want to dress alike and what one learns they all learn we could leap forward in science a hundred years. So, <laughs> you know, it's the idea that we could we could exploit this for our own benefit. Again, it's like the the ancient the eighteenth century idea of the perfectibility of man. We can we can improve ourselves by you know learning from them and and indeed as they the kids say themselves, we're learning from you. You know, they're sort of mm. they're sort of parasitic in this way. Um, and 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 Zellaby gets pushed back from General Layton. You know, uh, and uh, and even a little bit of suspicion um from from general Layton, you know who's saying well maybe your judgment's compromised here because one yeah. of these kids is your yeah. son and and the, and there's an interesting thing here about actually the um the casting in this sense because obviously in this period again the the reds under the bed fear is is a thing and with respect to george sanders of course you know he's often he, he's often been cast up to this point as kind of a smooth sort of villain kind of character or sort of having a villainous you know, sort of slightly sinister qualities. Um, and one thing that's interesting to remember, of course, is um, George Sanders himself is, uh, was born in Russia, in St. Petersburg. So is this, this, maybe this is something that would presumably be known at the time, but, uh, you know, this, this sense of the kind of perfect Englishman is um, he's possibly sort of compromised at this, um, at this level of, of this belief that, uh, you know, you can reshape society in this way and, and you can you know you can take advantage of this sort of enemy subversion and uh you know own it in some way and not see it as as dangerous and, and that's the moment where the kind of you know the the sort of uh the idea of 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 you know perhaps the the, the subversive liberal threat you know um kind of crystallizes in people's minds and it's it's a question between you know the idea of survival and of of trying to you know adapt people to you people who are clearly you know hostile as, as these children are it's it's definitely a tension as you say like imagine he's like imagine how high up the line could go if if we I, harness these children i, I don't know i mean in terms i, I don't know, i don't know if it's so much of a, li like a liberalism argument or an argument against liberalism or or, or a weakness of it and, and more than the fact that we just didn't want to we just didn't feel comfortable with killing children without fully understanding their purpose i think i'm trying to think trying to think how to, how to word it but well i'm using liberalism it, 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 as a very just, broad it, brush granted yeah and 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 it's the idea that um the, the the subversion comes in a package that's very hard to refuse yeah i mean i can you know i, I mean? can certainly understand it because i mean you know if, if you if, I, I can certainly appreciate like more sort of primitive societies or you know authoritarian societies totalitarian of the sorts you know wielding the hammer a lot quicker than than say like a, a, a democracy like uh you know like like britain of the of the 60s I, I think if anything they there was almost like a demonstration of the, in that scene of of our you know sort of moral superiority because you know at one point they're like oh so we're just going to kill the children and they're like no like right, we're not going to do that like th that we, we seem to be the only ones obviously besides the australians because the kids didn't survive there um mm. but we seem to be the only one not probably that step um at least from a a governmental governmental uh perspective because obviously that's in terms of the ending of the film it's not the government that, that steps in mm. if anything it's uh it's uh it's, it's it's gordon who who take who takes that takes that step it is well i think the the film as you say when you're growing up in britain it's it's the obvious thing is you would say like well they're just children like we need to be cautious we need to That's wait and, whereas society i mean they're they're called primitive but they have a strong out group sorry they have a strong in-group preference and they did not suffer the ill effects that these children caused 
um i mean i it, it's it's not a line i want to drag the discussion down but there are how can i say it's, it's some, a of, some some of the issues um occurring in multiple towns around the country at the moment that have been going on for decades uh, would have been handled very differently if they'd have been uncovered or had occurred say in the 1920s yeah I mean, I think it's okay to say that the North Centralese wouldn't have taken too kindly to the to the children, but there are advantages uh, to to that approach. Yeah, um, there there are. I think it just. I think, I, I just think that when when we, it it was almost as I say, I, I sort of read the scene as 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 looking at other cultures and other societies as more barbaric because they took, you know, in Russia's case, quite literally, like the mm. nuclear option. Whereas you know we, it, it was it was showing our our society to be a bit more you know mature and sort of saying you know look you know we realise yeah. it's a threat but we mm. but we but we need to understand it we need to fully assess it because there is potential that actually they well, they might very well be a, th a threat but equally if we can if we can get them to sort of if we can get them on our side on our level then they could also be of a huge benefit it's kind of like what you, what you sort of say what you sort of said about the strengths and weaknesses to, to, to liberalism uh, horror mm. show, you know, we, we could be a real asset for us or they could be, you know, a, a, a huge threat, but we would, we would like to give the, give it a chance to see where before we have to maybe take the nuclear option ourselves. It's, it's almost harm principle. They haven't harmed us yet. Obviously they have at that point. Um, but yeah, but again, I it's think it's a very kids... interesting moral challenge. Yeah, and it yeah. is handled well, and it is not heavy-handed. I would say the Russian use of the nuke option is quite—it's just a very good story beat as well. As it's in, because they... the tensions yeah, mounting up, and you find out that a society a bit closer to yours has given up and has yeah. had to do it. So it's it's a tension uh, yeah. mounted. And it's uh, very much slim. It's very... That's an, that's a good quote, and uh, I think I recognise it from yeah, another yeah. piece of movie analysis. <laughs> it's, it's very yeah, it's yeah. very much crystallised in the line that David has. You know, because Alan goes to confront them. You know, Alan, mm. the brother-in-law, uh, who, who's the yes. military officer, and 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 he says, I think he says something like, you know, oh, what you, what you're doing? Well, you know, it's against the law. And the kids pretty much say, well, we reject the law. <laughs> you know, and they I love that they, bit. They, they, they <laughs> All right, mind. sovereign citizens. You know, they read his mind. About Am what's I being happened. detained? <laughs> <laughs> and you know, and so, so they so they know what's happened to the Russian children. Mm. You know, they've been yeah. You know, and so they, and they put the zap on Alan, and and you know, he kind of gradually recovers. But uh, uh, later on, you know, um, David when he confronts Zelaby, you know, and he and and he's almost kind of you know, he almost kind of admires Zelaby, and he has this line. He says, you know, if yeah. you didn't suffer from emotions, from feelings, you could be as powerful as we are. Mm. Yeah. There's, yeah, um, again, yeah, th th there is an admiration to, to, oh, to Gordon. No, as I say, like, mm. th there is that obvious uh, admiration from the children towards Gordon. And I think it's because intellectually yeah. he's on their level. Um, yeah. yeah. And they, he doesn't, they, they, they he out. obviously hasn't bought into the idea that David's his son. Yeah. Mm. Like, yeah. their relationship is so interesting. Um, mm. I think the only, I did have a problem with David. Um, I just, it, it, it might not be a problem, really, but it's when he chooses to spell out his plans a little bit. He does talk about we'll be able to start other colonies. I was like, oh, it's just you, you sort of when you say that you're amping up the need. You're, you're raising your profile, po sorry, profile as a threat. Mm. And I thought, oh, is that a smart thing to do? Like if you know your group's getting wiped out. Would you maybe try and play it down a bit? Um, maybe you just thought we weren't going to do it. Possible. Again, I mean, it it could also just be it's another tension multiplier. It's a it's a just increase the threat. Uh, so a decision mm -hmm. has to be made. And there's um, an aware there's an awareness of that because you know General Leighton earlier on. I mean, they're having the discussion about what to do about these kids. And, you know, they're, they're saying, well, you know, these 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 mysterious things are happening. You know, there's a little boy who's drowned, you know, and well, you know, the kids didn't do it or at least we didn't see them. But they obviously used their mind powers to do it. And 
and there's an exchange mm. between Leighton and Zellaby and you know well what, what what do we do with them you know do we do we put them in well, you know do we bump them off you know and 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 uh General Leighton says yes we might well we might imprison them and he has this odd odd little line he says uh, but this isn't the police state yet <laughs> yeah yeah also just think you you're going to imprison them mm. how long do you think they live for my guy oh I, there is a real thing of yes i this is a threat we we aren't equipped to handle via liberal methods and they really want to keep those values um mm. which is a nice point of tension you know you can almost see post world war ii a sort of a desire to make sure you don't fall into heavy-handed tactics um, yeah again it's so interesting i love how they handled it um but bearing i'm i'm looking at our um our time here so i think we probably do need to move on as uh, there are basically there are several attempts to take the kids out and none of them work um but that they are rather similar to be up to be fair um there was the approach by the uh I just don't think a mob with torches ever goes down well. You... <laughs> I know. Yeah. It's so yeah. daft. Right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but again, it's there are a lot of these uh, of these scenes basically. Um, yeah. Oh, man. I just loved all of this. David David here absolutely nailed. It. I mean, they got they did so well with child casting. Mm. Um. Oh, but yeah. ultimately, but um, Gordon decides that action has to be taken. That they, they do respect him, and they're very frank with, with him in describing what they can do. It's it's interesting. They do sort of respect him on a level. Mm. Yeah, and we've we've learned they've got astonishing powers now because they confess. They mm. say, "Well, we can now hit aeroplanes, basically." I know without with our mind. He and really doesn't want to do it, but they are just telling him very openly, we're going to make colonies, our powers are growing, we can read yeah. your mind, we'll be able to read deeper. Yeah, it's just blackmail at this point. <laughs> you know, John, you do with... disavow, <laughs> disavow. <laughs> I knew it was coming. It had to be done. I was low-key working on a little um, meme of the kids with the Zuma hair. I yeah, abandoned it. Um, which is probably for the best. Yes, uh, your man decides he has to take uh, take matters into his own hands. Hmm. Oh. And and I well, the first time I watched the film, actually, I sort of mm. kind of missed the emotional beats in this section toward you know the very mm. last act, and and going back and watching it again, actually, the the little lead up to the final sort of confrontation in the schoolhouse mm. um i actually found um george sanders incredibly moving um because you realize obviously silently it's not really explicitly laid out in the script but you realize that he's he come to the to the view that he's going to have to take them out his on his own yeah and he's going to have to give his own life to do it and so he puts together the the time the time time bomb which he which he carries into the school and mm. he does so by preventing them from reading his mind by i mean this was an interesting feature of the set design in, in the, the mm. very first slide you showed of the, his study and just to the left of the fireplace there's this section of stripped wall with exposed brickwork which did you notice they focused on it a couple of times it, it, mm. indeed and, 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 and before the the scene where he looks at it in preparation uses it as a conscious sort of thing to sort of to mentally block off his mind um so the kids can't yeah. penetrate it but i actually thought also, there's also an interesting double meaning to it in the early scenes as well because you know it's also a sort of notion of a kind of a an area that's kind of been x-rayed you can see through the plaster you can see how the thing is made and it's a little bit like what happens with this community you kind of see the the the, the, the tensions and the weaknesses underneath Mm. uh you know in a sense and um so you have this thing where he, he he obviously realizes what he's got to do and he sends his his wife away to with alan to london 
And um, I realize now actually the farewell is quite heartbreaking because you realize mm -hmm. he knows he's seeing her off and he's, he's never going to see her again. Um, yeah. Uh, and you only kind of realize this later. It's, 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 it's really poignant and he plays it beautifully. And I think the line that sticks with me is he's seeing them off out of the door, you know, and this is where my, my sort of thesis about the, the whole thing of living in the shadow of the atomic age comes back. And he says to her, it's 8.15 and you'll be in London by 9.30. You know, well, I mean, at 8.15, we all know the uh, the lyrics of Enola Gay. It's the time that it's always been. It's it's the moment when the bomb went off over Hiroshima. Mm. Um, oh, and wow. what was the bomb called? It was called Little Boy. Mm. So it, it kind of sort of, I think maybe something captured there. It could be unintentional, I don't know. But it, it's, uh, you know, um, but, uh, you know, uh, I, I think, you know, he, he then walks into the school and says, right, we're going to talk about atomic energy tonight. <laughs> you know, so oh, it's, yeah. Um, yeah. No, that I don't think, maybe not every detail, but they are very aware of, <laughs> that was mm. very conscious. But just before that, I, I was really touched by him um, saying goodbye to the dog. We haven't said much about the dog, but mm. the dog was lovely and him just really understating it saying mm. goodbye to the dog and you just got the feeling the dog knew mm. 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 i mean the dog was wise man he didn't he didn't like that didn't like the kid from day one <laughs> no the dog was absolutely uh correct yeah. on this uh See, the, the kid should have admired the doggo the doggo was the smartest one the doggo yeah. was like no nah, get it get it gone so i i, I found most of the 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 scares earlier i whenever this film used violence i felt it was fairly ineffective because of how censored it had to be mm. whereas the sense of unease it created at the start was so powerful and that sense of unease that it creates now is the best bit of it you see him genuinely scared george sanders just plays this up wonderfully and the way he is try he he thinks it will work he's got his plan but the children do instantly know something is up hmm. and him fighting to have control i thought was done so well how, how did you find yeah. this scene yeah gripping mm. gripping I, I i loved it i lo i love the sort of like the the, the blending of like the close up of his forehead yes this and just watching mm. that wall getting chipped away as the kids are trying to break mm. through to find out what's going on. And uh, it's just at the last sort of second when it hits half eight or half nine, um, when they realize, oh my God, there's a bomb. <laughs> and it's mm. like, he's held off for just long enough. If we had, if the effects had been easier to do, there's a beautiful blend between the censored version and our version. Um, so obviously the BUSC said you can't have the glowing eyes. And without the glowing eyes, you get the children actually uh, opening their eyes in shock. Yeah. But gosh, I'd love to have them doing right. the glowing eyes and also having the surprised reaction, which we mm. could probably, you know what? You could probably whip that up in uh, After Effects reasonably quickly, and I might be tempted to do that. Oh, I mean, there's also a, there's a scene in Zombie Flesh Eaters with, um, uh, let's say, um, the the door scene. If people have seen that movie, um, without giving it away, um, people who've seen it will know that scene cuts off just before a pivotal thing. And I've always wondered if I could use After Effects to complete that. Um, it sort of stops right. before the damage is really done. I, I'm keeping that reasonably um, oblique for you, um, folks, as we are covering Zombie Flesh Eaters soon. Um, yeah, it's it's simple. It doesn't waste your time. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest. I wouldn't have had a problem if they had tried to Hitchcock would have dragged it out a lot longer. You know, um, mm. the dramatic tension would have been there. The the dramatic irony, um, you know, he has a, the entirety of rope um, is built around this thing that you're wondering if it will be discovered. So I imagine Hitchcock would have 
had this last a lot longer and really built the tension up. But I don't mind this approach either, um, where they just get straight down to him being rumbled by the children, just instantly. I thought it was quite cool because again, it just demonstrates how powerful they are. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I don't, I don't want to say that uh, that that Gordon underestimated them because mm. uh, I think that would be unfair. Um, but I definitely think he realized the challenge just to keep how difficult the challenge would be to keep them out of his mind mm. just long enough and the fact that he was able to yeah as say to hold out for, for long enough for, for the village um was great um but yeah i i i really love this scene i i loved as well how his wife just sort of picked up on that you know, why did he mm. ask you to take care of me? Just realizing something's wrong and then and then going back. Mm. And I also like this is really strange, but I, I really like the fact that the film ended there and that there was no sort of like scene afterwards. You know, you, I, again, you know, this film's very efficient, you know, with the 77 mm. minute runtime. It's mm. just that there is a lot of efficiency in this film. And, uh, yeah, it, I think it ended at the right point as well, because that's it. Threat's over. Our protagonist has died in the blaze. We don't you're, need to know what happens the, afterwards. I mean, you can probably see this is a thing from every 1960 film I've shown you, is they don't drag the ending out. Mm. Um, yeah. Psycho might be the only exception. I uh, mm -hmm. I don't consider it dragged out. It's um, you get some. Uh, well, we won't go into it, but it's it, it's it feels important. it always feels a little pat the ending of Psycho. I mean, we don't have to spoil it or anything, but there is something about, as you say, the way it it kind of gets to the climax, it ends, and then there's a little kind of and if you weren't paying attention, <laughs> kind of explainer. Did you, you know. get it? Dum dum. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know. Yeah. Yes. Um, but this mm. is an interesting image to end on. This is this sort of, you know, the, 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 the image of burning timbers, of course. You know, this mm. is within within living memory, the memory of most people of of, of the last war, you know, of, of, yeah. of, you know, the bombs coming down. And, I mean, I always think it's, it was particularly significant at the beginning of the film. You know, the clock, when it strikes, it strikes at 11, you know, the time of memorial, the time mm. of, of remembering. And, and the, the thing about it, as you say, is the economy of Zellaby going in, doing you know just acting with his eyes that struggle of having to do the most painful thing uh mm. and and realizing that it, what it comes down to is that moment where you decide how you bear your relation to society mm. and and he carries it out with the simple act of heroism and devotion and sacrifice yeah and he's That's... also having to impose his will it is a battle of wills yeah um mm. yeah as you said, it's, it's the right thing for him to do. I mean, you're thinking this is 15, he, he was mid fifties at the point. So, you know, he probably would have fought. And it's once again, he's, he's called in to do his duty, as you say. And it's just so dignified. And you don't get long to mourn it. It just goes, no, uh, goes into the ending. <laughs> no longer by i mean and, and, and i know slim says uh, as something i remember as well as as the building goes up you see the eyes mm. seemingly disperse yeah so it's a little bit ambiguous you know it's like well it's still out there they've maybe they've just evaporated you know or mm. they've just gone somewhere else now but it doesn't matter you know the final the final act is enough and you you know once you i think you watch the film the second time you kind of go ah right okay it, it's not just a sort of schlocky bad sfx ending um it's about the man uh. mm. i mean the the model that they set on fire was a bit bad um unfortunately that that did not age well but th throughout this you you are just kept kept in doubt over what the children are and that definitely works to its strength you know are they supernatural are they just alien it doesn't tell you, but I, I feel like the, the eyes leaving does lean it towards a slightly more supernatural explanation, but that's just me. 
interesting. There's an interesting. I mean, it's quite a touching and poignant symmetry as well. With um, I looked up uh, information about George Sanders, obviously, and uh, very sadly, he he committed mm. suicide in 1972, mm. and uh, he left behind this suicide note, which is very powerful, and um, because he'd had um, you know, problems with his marriages and and mm. and and bereavements and and depression and drinking, and he he took five bottles of barbiturate you know which is, is is obviously fatal and uh, he wrote this very short suicide note he said dear world i'm leaving because i am bored i feel i've lived long enough i'm leaving you with your worries in this sweet cesspool good luck um and that idea of feeling that you've lived long enough i think that's kind of expressed in this performance mm. it is it is an odd one watching him in this i mean uh all about eve i loved him in um but this one, you are sort of reminded of the sort of difficulties that he is an older man. Uh, it's, it's about nine years after All About Eve and that aspect of him, yeah, making that sacrifice it is poignant. There is a poignancy to it. It's a bit heartbreaking, really. Wow, oh, I didn't even know that he uh, he did that. Mm. Um. I find a similar thing uh, whenever I watch the carry-ons and poor, poor Charles, um, Charles Hawtrey, um, who had a, a very troubled life and it's, he sort of, how can I say, he sort of circled the drain for quite a while. Mm. Um, right. It's like, I'm, I'm, that's a very depressing topic. I, I'll probably move off it, but, uh, it's yeah, quite, Susan won't like yeah, it. Yeah, it's very, it's just very weird watching Charles Hawtrey in Carry On films, being this gleeful, mirthful lad. Um, but yeah, I, I get the similar vibes. Um, but we're very much at the end now. Um, I do feel this was very much the superior version of it, although you know it doesn't have Mark Hamill in. But you know, I, I think it still manages to succeed despite that. Hmm. Yeah, so it's not regarded as one of John Carpenter's best, his, uh, no. his version of Vilcher of the Damned. Um, shall we move into closing thoughts and scores out of 12? And chat, if you watch this and you want to pitch your score out of 12 burgers, you'd be super welcome to. Um, uh, Simon, would you like to mm. go first? Oh, I, didn't, I, didn't, I don't know about... As you say, it was a bit like... Um... The, like when I was on last time, you, you're sort of torn by contrary emotions when you're thinking about scoring films. I mean, you said at the start it's, it's kind of one of the weaker films in a way. But then when, when I start to sort of dig into it, I mean, there is, there is a lot of interest there in terms of the convergence of these, these themes and these worries at this time. So it's, it's, it's kind of interesting as a social document of a moment, as you say, mm -hmm. not a literal moment, but, uh, you know, a, a story told through these, these metaphors. Uh, you know about these these pressing concerns, and so I think it's got a, a value in that. I'd I'd say you know it's obviously a genre classic as well. So mm. I mean I'm I'm probably going to be very fair to it, and because of George Sanders' performance, I'm going to give it a ten uh, because uh, because of the I think the effect it had, especially the second time round. The first time, I just thought bit of fluff, bit of kind of sort of slightly schlocky, you know, production, but then there was something. Um, there was something more about it, so it, a ten, a ten at a minimum, I would say. I find I find that very convincing. I'd I'd say the horror is, as a pure horror film, it's weak. Mm. Um, the censorship did not help it, um, and there are moments that could have made it much scarier. But in terms of intellectual stimulation and quality, it's right up there. Um, yeah, for my for myself, uh, I mean, I think we we we've been a bit harsh. We we have overlooked a lot of people. Um, Barbara Shelley I mean, just does an absolutely wonderful turn. Uh, the chap who leads the mob, uh, I really liked. Um, he did he did such a good job. Um, but. Yeah, aside from the lack of horror. There's so much in it that is absolutely fascinating and uh, challenging as well. Um, so it just be it becomes fascinating on its own and also extra fascinating in retrospect. Um, 
this sort of clash of values of sort of costs of liberal values is amazing as well. Uh, I'm very much reminded of the fact that in Rope there is an ongoing discussion of that, um, which is quite interesting to see now when that challenge is sort of taken off taken off the table. It's just not an option. So it's it's really interesting to see something actually explore the costs of that approach. Um, so I it's a it's a case where I would have liked a little less censorship, and it didn't have to be seventy seven minutes. Uh, if it could have taken just a tiny bit longer to maybe squeeze a bit more tension out for me, so that that would cost it a few points. Um, I I I feel I feel we're more in a nine than a ten, but I'm pr I'm pretty darn happy with it. You know, I'm pretty darn happy, and I, I've got a feeling I'm going to watch this one again. So yeah, n nine out of uh, nine out of twelve burgers sounds right for me. How about you, TCG? I'm going to go with a ten. A ten? <clears throat> yeah, I yeah. Stinged it. Say that again. Have I stinged it? I think you might have a little bit. This film's great. I'm possibly I mean, a gore hound. Anyway, go ahead. I, I, I mean, yeah. Don't get me wrong. I, I love me. I love me a bit of a. Uh, love me a bit of gore. But when it comes to watching these films, I kind of expect that we're not going to be getting, you know, blood and guts. Although, don't mind you saying that. I was surprised when we, when we covered the, uh, what was it last week? Uh, anyway, um, eyes without a face. That's the one. Yeah, yeah I just, I, I think this was great. I mean, this was my first. I believe my first george sanders movie mm. that I'd, I'd seen and uh, i really really liked his character uh i i thought barbara shelley in particular as the mum she she was really really uh really good as well uh the kids were even good but that but that's i think because they they look so out of place and you know kids typically act quite wooden especially in those days mm -hmm. uh the the experience wouldn't have been as uh as, as in-depth as say like kids to do an adult's life but um but the fact that they were playing out of this world quote unquote um children i think the the fact that they couldn't act that well only added to the to the creepiness um mm -hmm. but yeah it does i thought this film makes you ask some serious questions uh, from, 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 a, from a morality perspective as to how you would handle this had you, had you found yourself in this little situation. You know, would you go the nuclear option like uh, Russia? Would you just, you know, tear them to pieces like the Mongolians and the Eskimos? Or, you know, or, or would you take the British approach and, and, and wait it out and see? And see? I, 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 I really, really liked it. I think it could have been a bit longer. I feel like it could have been a bit longer, but having said that, the seventy-seven minute runtime doesn't really impact the story that that bad. Like it doesn't, it doesn't um, doesn't miss out parts of the story, or it doesn't sort of gloss over things just for the sake of like, being time efficient. Mm -hmm. I think Harry would say, you know, there's there's a direct plot, you know, that the points connect, and uh, it it concludes in a in, in quite an efficient way as, as the rest of the film had done. So yeah, I, I would give it a 10 easily. If I could give it, if I could give it a higher score, if I could give it a higher score, it would have been for things like, you know, bit of gore. I would have liked to have seen a little after shot of the guy after he, you know, self sepakud after the kids, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> after the kids hypnotized him. Um, it has time to build up scares and tension and give you uh, yeah. views from around like um, I might be wrong, but you you have a good scene with the vicar in early. Mm. Um, just you have these characters in, just explore how how they're doing later, maybe. Yeah. But maybe that's yeah. why every movie ends up about one hundred and five minutes. So. Mm. Well, that's it. Yeah, yeah. But again, I think you know this is a really good film, concise. I enjoyed it a lot mm. more than I was gonna than than I was expecting to. So, yeah, yeah easily a ten for me. I no I no 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 mention... no cheese. I don't think it was cheesy. <laughs> I should mention one other thing, and I, I made a note so I knew I'd mention it. Um, exactly one year later, after this film, a little uh, TV series by the name of The Twilight Zone 
put out an episode called It's a Good Life, which is about a okay. young child about David's age who has strong psychic abilities and is able to control all the adults around him. Based. It's interesting. Um, if you liked this, you might want to check that episode out. And in general, popping on one of the old Twilight Zone episodes is usually a pretty good time. So you, you like might it. like that. There's there's the bad seed from the 50s, uh, where it's a little girl who is rather evil. Um, and there's that episode of the Twilight Zone if you want to check out something similar, but slightly different. So I thought I, I'd have to mention it. Um, with that all done, I'm, I'm so pleased by the response to this. I really am. I'm, I'm surprised that I'm the one stinging it. Um, I love that Slim. This is this is a big one for you. I'm trying to remember. Was it the Enriab last week? Gave uh, gave eyes without a face a twelve. I think it was. I love that we're finding some real um, some real big hitters for people. That's fantastic. Um, but with that covered. I should do the horror homework, and it's a special one. Um, so your standard horror homework is Psycho from 1960, as you will be unsurprised to hear. We are covering that. That has to be the cap. How else could we end this? It's got to be Psycho. Uh, that should be an absolute beauty. Watch that. And if you enjoy it, um, try some of the other ones from the series. Massive... Um, Massive kudos if you give Psycho 4 a go. I, I genuinely like it. It's a TV movie uh, and a kind of prequel. It's very interesting. Um, and as a bonus, I'm giving you advance warning because this is a bigger one, okay? Um, in September, we are we're doing Simptember. I'm basically going to do a lot of your requests and special what? projects. <laughs> so um, I'm giving you advance warning. We're going to cover The Haunting of Hill House. And that is a 10 part series where each episode is about an hour long. So I want to give you advance warning. Uh, you can find The Haunting of Hill House on Netflix and other places on the internet. Um, it's it's a series I absolutely love. I think it's one of the best things that's happened in horror in a long time. And I hope you'll love it too. But because it is about 10 hours long, I wanted to give you advance warning so you're not having to absolutely blitz it. So that is going to be the second week in September. And I will remind you each week going forward. But you heard it here first, guys. Um, priority is Psycho and watch The Haunting of Hill House the series um, as a bonus. All right. Um, and with that, I think I'm probably going to have to leave it here. Um, I've really enjoyed this discussion, guys. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah, it's a good recommendation. Yeah. Very yeah, much so. You, you, Simon, you, you bring a really good perspective to this and so much stuff that I had not heard of and had not considered. Yeah, um, as I say, um, I, I leaned very heavily on that book, uh, Welcome to Mars by Ken Hollings, and uh, do check that out. Um, he also made a radio series of it as well. And that's got, it's, it's just such an interesting period, this, this moment after the war to the build of, uh, you know, the kind of modernity that mm. um, people were sort of expecting and craving and then confronting and then not quite uh, able to deal with in many ways. So, uh, yeah, he, he charts a lot of that very interesting underpinning of lots of this stuff yeah I, I think the radio might work better for me i am very intrigued mm. all right lovely well with that i think we'll wrap up thank you so much guys and thank you chat i loved your input tonight um and slim i'm so pleased that we got a 12 out of 12 for you that is brilliant that, that makes me very happy i love it when i uh, get to show someone I introduce someone to something and, and it's just absolutely their thing. It makes me really happy. I'm going to sign off uh, as I've got a massive filming session tomorrow. But thanks for being with us tonight. Uh, thank you again, Simon and TCG. And uh, I'll leave it there. Thanks, y'all. Cheers.